Minister of Education. So we will start our program first by Saraswati Vandana. I would request Dr. Madhu to play the video for Saraswati Vandana. Uh, Dr. Monica will play it. A very good afternoon. Namaste from India and Salamat Futang from Malaysia to all of you. On behalf of Department of Botany, Deshbindu College, I, Aparna Nautial, extend a warm welcome to all the delegates, eminent speakers, scientists, research, research scholars, faculty and students across different parts of the world for this three-day live webinar series on the theme entitled Understanding flora from aquatic ecosystems toward better conservation and sustainable use. We are fortunate that this webinar is being jointly organized by Department of Botany, Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, in collaboration with Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia. Despite of having differences in time zones of both the countries, this has been executed by the dedicated team of both the host institutes within a short span of time. A famous quote by Sylvia Earle, a famous oceanographer says, with every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you are connected to the sea, no matter where on earth you live, most of the oxygen in atmosphere is generated by the sea. With this concern for the coastal ecosystems and their significance on the planet, we thought of organizing this webinar in collaboration. This joint webinar is aimed at providing knowledge and insight of research work related to conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of flora of aquatic ecosystems to the students, researchers, as well as faculty members. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our chief guest of the first day of our webinar, Professor Sumiani Yusuf, Director, Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia. It's our pleasure to have you, ma'am, today in this webinar. I also welcome our one and only hardworking, dynamic and dedicated principal of Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, Professor Rajiv Agarwalji, for this webinar series. He has been always a guiding and inspiring force to all of us in our college for any kind of activity. I also welcome our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Aditya Saxena, and DBT Star Scheme coordinator, Dr. Indrakan Singh, for being a big support to us. I also welcome all my senior colleagues, my friends and dear students who have joined us today. I wish all the best for the three-day webinar series to entire organizing team from Department of Botany, 
Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, India, under convenership of our Dr. Madhurani and organizing team of Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia, under convenership of Dr. Sahdev Sharma. We are looking forward to make this event a successful and fruitful one with this strong collaboration. Finally, I would like to say that may everyone enjoy this three-day live webinar series and gather some interesting and insightful information at the end of the event. I would now request and invite our principal, sir, Professor Rajiv Agarwalji, to kindly address the audience. Sir, you may please take uh, over the session. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aparna, for the kind words. Uh, friends, greeting, namaskar, and a warm welcome to you all. All of you who are here this afternoon, Indian afternoon, from all around the globe for making a significant difference by exchanging ideas in botany. It gives me great privilege, honor, and happiness to welcome you all through this online medium to this three days webinar on the topic, Understanding Flora from Aquatic Ecosystems Towards Better Conservation and Sustainable Use, which is jointly organized by Department of Botany, Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, and Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I would like to extend my welcome note to our chief guest today, Professor Sunyani Yusuf, Director IOES UM, and all the participants from this university on behalf of my institution, Deshbandhu College. Friends, as far as our college is concerned, our Deshbandhu College was established in 1952. It is the oldest and one of the largest college in the South Campus Wing of University of Delhi, India, having over more than 5,000 students on board, studying and securing top positions in the university on a regular basis in all the major disciplines in arts, humanities, commerce, and sciences. Our esteemed faculty members have the maximum and the best of both research and creative publications credentials over the decades. We have contributed towards the growth of the nation by producing top-notch scientists, entrepreneurs, journalists, diplomats, sports persons, and literary artists. Our college is unique college in the entire Delhi University to offer courses in all major Indian languages, including their language like Sindhi. It makes me proud to announce that the list of achievements is too long to be fully displayed here. Our department of botany in particular, the prime mover of, of this webinar boasts of having internationally reputed scholars whose research works have made great breakthroughs in the science research so far. They have been apart from their regular engaged in research and publications, invited faculty members and research scientists in prestigious universities all over the academic world. Friends, as far as today's topic is concerned, it is definitely an important topic and worthy topic for all of us, at least for the botanists. Aquatic plants are most important ecological components of the rivers, lakes, wetlands, and coastal to marine environments. The aquatic flora creates habitats ranging from seagrass, meadows, and mangrove forest to tree floating communities in freshwater points and lakes. Such valuable natural ecosystem services play a major role in the structure and functioning of these environments. Seeing the widespread evidence of the globe loss and degradation of these ecosystems, there is an urgent need to control this loss, encouraging research into the conservation ecology of these species. There is a critical necessity to learn more about the interactions between the aquatic plants and future global change. Aquatic biodiversity is a major concern in water conservation and restoration projects, as well as water resource management. Conservation management of coastal environments in the near future requires increased knowledge of how these aquatic plants respond to anthropogenic change and how they can be managed to be resilient to these changes. During this three days webinar, six lectures will be delivered by eminent scientists, faculties, and researchers from four different countries two from Malaysia, one from Bangladesh, one from Indonesia, and two from India. In the end, I would like to express our thanks and gratitude to all the organizers of this webinar 
my friends and colleagues at Department of Botany Deshpandu of College, convener of this webinar, Dr. Aparna Nautial, our, IQ, uh, our DBT Star College Scheme Coordinator, Dr. Indrakal Singh, Dr. Aditya Saxena, our IQSE coordinator, and friends, friends from Indi Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to organize this worthy event. Let the next three days witness an unprecedented exchange of fruitful knowledge, engaging several hundred scholars and science enthusiasts participating here. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, respected principal, sir, for your encouraging words. You have always been a big support and mentor to all of us in the college. Thank you, sir. Now I would kindly request and invite our chief guest, Professor Somiani Yusuf, Chairperson, Director, Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia, to kindly address our gathering. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Honorable Professor Dr. Rajiv uh, Agarwal, Principal Deshbandu College, Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. Uh, Dr. Indra Khan Singh, Coordinator, DBT Star College School. Uh, Dr. Aditya Saxena, Coordinator, Internal Quality Assurance of Deshbandu College. Dr. Aparma Nautiel, uh, Teacher in Charge, Department of Bio... Uh, I think we yeah. have Deshbandu College and Organizing Committee and Technical Advisor. Uh, my colleagues, my staff from the Institute of Ocean and Earth Science, uh, especially um, uh, Dr. Sahadev, who has actually made this uh, coordination and also this collaboration between the two uh, universities and uh, college uh, to uh, promote and also to organize, uh, I think, this very important uh, webinar. Uh, all the other organizing committees and technical advisors, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, to everyone. Uh, indeed, I am uh, honored yeah, to, and also am uh, happy on behalf of University of Malaya and the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences of UM, I would like to take the opportunity to extend our warmest welcome to each and every one of you for attending this three-day seminar or web webinar uh, on understanding flora from aquatic ecosystems towards better conservation and sustainable use. Uh, University of Malaya, through the Institute of Ocean and Earth Science, is proud to co-host this important international webinar together with Deshbandu College, University of uh, Delhi, India. This webinar is also made possible with the support uh, from the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology under the Government of India. The main motivation, I think, of this webinar is to promote awareness and to provide insightful knowledge about various research works related to conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of flora of aquatic ecosystems, not only to the students, but also to the researchers, as well as faculty members. It also aims to establish a platform for better networking between University of Delhi, India and the University of Malaya, Malaysia through Institute of Ocean and Earth Science. Hopefully, with our combined expertise, we can find ways to forge meaningful and enhance research collaboration in the future. And looking through the program of this three-day international webinar, I am pleased to find that Two scientists from University of Malaya will present their research works on the mangrove and seagrass ecosystems. I think this is very important uh, and I hope that by giving some examples from the coastal and marine ecosystem, this webinar is able to convey a more comprehensive outlook on the various aquatic flora so that we can appreciate the importance and connectivity between the terrestrial, peatland and marine environment. I'm sure that we can learn a lot from all the speakers whom their interesting presentations will also help inspire undergraduate students to pursue their, in the pursuit of postgraduate studies in disciplines related to these fields. Yeah? 
And looking at the importance of the aquatic flora of the world, it is relevant for this webinar to highlight the importance in ASEAN region, especially covering various aspects of aquatic flora research, such as on blue carbon and biodiversity, benefits and impacts in climate change and other related fields. So indeed, I think both Malaysia and India have tremendously rich biodiversity of flora, which have provided many natural resources and ecosystem services to our people and our countries. The different plants, forests and ecosystem will significantly contribute towards the livelihood of many communities and the economy of our countries. It is therefore crucial to me that such biological resources should be managed sustainably and safeguarded against degradation, destruction and loss. Yeah? So regardless of being terrestrial or marine, many of these environments are facing threats of climate change. Some continue to be overexploited and polluted by various waste due to our anthropogenic and callous activities. There's an urgent need for all of us to be part of the solution. And not only that, to overcome these problems through better understanding, awareness and engagement between all levels of society, conducting more multidisciplinary research and the application of scientific knowledge in their conservation and management plans, including policy and governance. In the last decades, researchers have discovered how mangroves, sea grasses, and peatlands can help mitigate the effects of climate change as they play a very important role of storing large amounts of carbon in the soil. And for coastal communities, especially mangroves can also provide some physical protection and help to minimize the impact of storm surges, tsunamis and cyclones, which sometimes occur in the Bay of Bengal, especially in Sudarbans. So ladies and gentlemen, Issues related to global environmental change is very close to all of us. Thus, this kind of international webinar can be a good platform and a good starting point to link our research talents and capabilities through smart partnerships with world-renowned institutions, forming the scientific strategic research collaborations that can produce more impactful research outcomes to address current global changes. We at the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, we are very proud of our achievement being in the top university in our country. We always welcome all researchers from various disciplines to come and learn together and work with us uh, in our uh, collaborative strategic uh, research work and also in our laboratories, in our UM campus in Kuala Lumpur, you know, with the facilities that we have. Uh, IUS manages also our, uh, we have a Bacho Marine Research Station you know, that can house uh, a lot of research and has many uh, history and also current uh, research work being conducted with uh, various researchers from around the world. So we welcome uh, all researchers from various disciplines to come learn and work together uh, in our uh, not only UM campus, uh, that is fully equipped with scientific instruments and other facilities. Yeah, like and I like and like I mentioned earlier, we also have our Bachok Marine Research Station, which is located in the east coast of uh, Peninsular Malaysia, overlooking the South China Sea and near to the Perhentian Islands, which has beautiful beaches, coral reefs, and a popular destination among tourists. So this could actually entice more of our colleagues uh, from India to come work with us while visiting our beautiful country. As you can see, even my background, I'm showing the beautiful beaches that we have in the country. And finally, I would like to congratulate the organizing committee and everyone who has worked hard for this uh, uh, organization of this webinar and who has contributed tremendously uh, to the success. And hopefully you will have a very fruitful endeavor and outcome uh, of this webinar. I hope all participants will find the talk and the webinar enjoyable, fruitful, uh, educational and informative and also the discussions stimulating. I wish you all a very successful webinar. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you.
thank you dear ma'am for your kind words and uh, encouragement uh, for all of us so that we can look forward for more such collaborations with your university and even can visit to your university for such research projects thank you so much ma'am and uh, we are also grateful to you for sparing your valuable time and uh, gracing this occasion thank you so much now i would request my dear colleague dr rubina chongthem to kindly take over the session for future proceedings over to you dr rubina thank you ma'am good afternoon uh, everyone it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker of our webinar series dr jillian oilian sim dr sim is a senior lecturer at the department of geography university malaya she is a sea grass ecologist and a biogeographer who seeks to understand the environmental requirements of multi species meadows and interactions between species in the marine ecosystem she has led several projects on the spatial ecology of sea grass fish communities in sea grass dugong feeding behavior in sea grass fishing community perceptions of sea grass amongst many and is currently developing predictive models for sea grass distribution in southeast asia Dr Sim is also involved in several international scientific associations representing Malaysia in programs such as the World Ocean Assessment of Intergovernmental Oceanic Commission of UNESCO in 2017. She is also a member of several prestigious societies like World Sea Grass Association, International Biogeography Society and several others. She has also contributed to the community and industry via various programs. Her exceptional work is illustrated by her numerous publications in the form of edited books, book chapters and research articles in academic journals. Today, through her talk on sea grass as faunal habitats, advocating for sea grass conservation via ecosystem services, she will address how ecosystem service focused studies on sea grass can help us to reframe sea grass advocacy for conservation and public awareness i request the participants to type their queries on the talk in the chat box that will be taken up after dr jillian's talk so without much ado i now invite dr jillian sim to present her talk over to you dr jillian sir thank you dr rubina for that introduction uh, allow me to share my screen uh, before i start let me click on that so i hope you can see what's on my screen hello everyone Thank you for joining me to uh, hear more about seagrass. This is my favorite ecosystem to talk about because there has been much less work done on seagrass than any other marine ecosystem. But first, I'd like to start by uh, saying hello to everyone. Good afternoon to my colleagues from uh, New Delhi University, and hello to my colleagues from the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences at the University of Malaya. Um, this talk will be about raising awareness about seagrass. and how we might do that by emphasizing the services that they provide to us now all of you would be fairly familiar with terrestrial grasslands called either savannas prairies steppes or belts depending on their location in the world but what is less known are the grasslands that occur underwater in the marine environment Now, for a plant to be categorized as a seagrass, it needs to fulfill four attributes. It needs to be able to live completely submerged underwater. It needs to be able to withstand living in high salinity water. It needs to have a root system that anchors it underground against water movement, and it needs to be able to reproduce fully underwater. And there are not many plants that can do this. Out of the three hundred thousand flowering plant species that we know exist today. Only 60 to 70 species have these four attributes. 
and this would be the seagrass. So, which means they are really unique life forms and they deserve better conservation attention than what we are giving them right now. Now, I do not think that a static photo of a seagrass meadow does it justice. So I will play you a video of a typical meadow in Malaysia. Now, what I find beautiful about seagrass is the amount of movement in it. There is so much life in a seagrass meadow because it has soft substrate with many hidden creatures in it. And the green that you see here are seagrass. And this is a sea cucumber. You can see that it's feeding, watch its tentacles. And underground that, in the, underground in the soft substrate, you would have uh, all manner of marine biodiversity, you know, burring shrimp, goby fish, polychaete worms, mollusk. Really is a rich ecosystem if you're patient and you look carefully. Now, this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'll talk to you about, firstly, what is seagrass, seagrass distribution in the world, the current status of seagrass, what the threats to seagrass might be, and I'll highlight some seagrass ecosystem services, including two case studies that we've been doing here in Malaysia. And I'll end with my take home message. Seagrass comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. And there are around 60 to 70 species in the world today. The large, largest species is Anhelis acroides, which is what you can see on the screen right now. It stands up to 1.5 meters height in the water column. But whatever it is, the two main forms of tropical seagrass can be categorized as either strap-shaped or rounded. Uh, strap-shaped meaning that it's flat, like a belt. There are some other variations, but these are the most typical forms in the tropics. Now, incidentally, the spoon-shaped seagrass from the genus Holophila is the smallest seagrass species. So it comes out to about three to five centimeters in height uh, from the stalk to the end of its leaf. Seagrass meadows can be either intertidal or subtidal. Subtidal seagrasses are never exposed to air. They are always submerged. And in very clear waters, actually, meadows have been found down to around 70 meters depth. And the deepest record of seagrass is at 145 meters of Cyprus. But most uh, seagrasses, though, in Malaysia, they extend from about 1 meter to 10 meters water depth. That's typical for our waters. Intertidal meadows, on the other hand, they occur in shallow waters where they are exposed at low tides. And these are very popular meadows for shellfish harvesting. And it's a really fun ecosystem to work in as a scientist. Now, if you're trying to visualize the zonation of seagrass, the intertidal and subtidal seagrass, this diagram might be helpful. This is the land. And then you have the mangrove here. And then uh, you have the intertidal seagrass out here that you know, gets exposed uh, at, at low tides. And then you have the, if there's a coral reef, a fringing coral reef, you would probably see the coral reef flat out here. And that's followed by the subtidal seagrass, which would be your deeper seagrass. There are six seagrass bioregions based on species composition. And this model, this bioregional model was first proposed by Fred Short and colleagues um, in 2007. So as you can see, the, the shading in, in orange, the tropical Indo-Pacific bioregion here has the highest seagrass diversity in the world. And it's also the largest seagrass bioregion. So those of us in India and in Malaysia, as I said, this is a really cool place to be if you're studying seagrass. Now this map shows that the center of seagrass biodiversity is clearly in Southeast Asia. Uh, in Australia, the east coast of Africa, and the Tamil Nadu coast of India. And if you see the dark green hatchings, that would have up to 12 to 15 species growing uh, in meadows at, together at any one time. Now, the reason for this talk on seagrass conservation is because of all the marine ecosystems that exist, seagrasses are the ones in the most precarious situation. Seagrasses are declining at a rate of 7% a year, meaning that we stand to lose seagrass at a rate of two football fields every 30 minutes. And scientists have been trying to call attention to this since the mid 2000s, as shown by some of these papers. So seagrass decline is comparable or maybe slightly higher than for mangroves and coral reefs, 
But what I find precarious about the situation of seagrass is that there is far less attention on seagrass than on any other marine ecosystem. And this knowledge gap is especially critical in the Indo-Pacific bioregion. Now, uh, this is the map from the Waycott paper, which I showed on the previous slide. And in this paper, the authors collated all existing data about seagrass meadows around the world to see if those meadows were um, increasing or declining or if they were static in size. But as you can see on the map, most of the studies were from North America here, Europe and Australia, which are developed nations. So that, there was practically nothing from the tropical Indo-Pacific region and from South America. So developing countries, therefore, those are where the great black hole in seagrass science exists. And you know, the 7% global decline pointed out by Michelle Waycott in her paper, that was based on these sites. So they're not based on developing countries. They were not based on the status of seagrass in developing countries. Um, I believe that if we included the rates of decline in the Indo-Pacific and in South America, it would be much higher than 7%. There are quite a few threats to seagrass, but these are just um, two of the biggest that I'd like to highlight, land reclamation and water pollution. Now, in terms of land reclamation, seagrasses um, are ecosystem en engineers, meaning wherever they occur, they are able to capture sand particles. And in doing so, they hold the sand particles down and build the land up. So they build new land. And this is one of their services to us, but it is also one of the reasons that seagrass areas are prime areas targeted for land reclamation. Water pollution from industrial, agricultural, and sewage effluent is another big problem because it creates algal blooms. So when nutrients in water increases, seaweeds or algae will outcompete seagrass because their population size just simply explodes. So this is a photo of a seaweed bloom in Qingdao, China, as an example, to give you a sense of the gravity of a seaweed bloom. So seagrasses will be smothered and they cannot get enough light for photosynthesis when they are covered by, by an algal bloom like this. But there is another threat to seagrass, and that's the whole point of this talk today. And that threat is low attention and interest. In 2018, a few seagrass scientists in Southeast Asia reviewed the status of seagrass in the region. And they said, the future of seagrass meadows in Southeast Asia is bleak and their degradation is expected to continue. And then also in 2018, Lena Nordlin and her team reminded us why this is so. They said that the biggest threat to seagrass is public indifference and unfamiliarity, which I agree with. Because in Malaysia, we have found this to be quite true. In a social survey that we ran in a fishing community in Johor, Malaysia, just be before the pandemic shut us down, we interviewed over 80 fishermen over a week. And we found that 46% had never seen seagrass, despite them being at the center of seagrass diversity in peninsular Malaysia. Um, and all of those fishermen who had never seen seagrass did not know that seagrass was actually fish habitat. 66% did not know seagrass was food for dugongs or sea cows. And I'm going to talk about that more later. And 4% actually thought seagrass was poisonous. So if people don't know very much about seagrass, then that is probably why threats against them continue to dominate headlines. How can we change this? How can we make people regard seagrass as something essential to them? Well, as scientists, this is one way, by directing our work towards ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is defined as um, natural processes and components of the environment that benefit human needs, either directly or even indirectly. Now, these are the four main categories of ecosystem services, um, provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services, and supporting services. And provisioning services, for example, would be where people harvest food and pharmaceuticals from meadows. 
climate regulation would be about global warming, uh, water purification, protecting beaches and regulating diseases, which I will talk more about later. But the ecosystem service that is um, the one that we really know the least about would be cultural services like recreation and ecotourism, education and aesthetics. And last but not least, we'll be supporting services where you know, things like um, nutrient cycling happens in seagrass meadows, and that creates fertile soils, fertile sediment for them. And also primary production occurs in seagrass meadows, and that leads to biomass production. And of course, seagrasses provide shelter for marine life. So um, studies about ecosystem services is important and useful, not just because they help us know about ecosystems, but because they capture attention better than other types of studies because of their explicit link to human needs and human consumption. So to me, ecosystem services is not just a theme of research that we do, you know, I think it's more than that. It can be a tool for conservation by raising public awareness. So in the next few slides, I will share a little bit about some of these services. Seagrass as food. In Indonesia, 35% of food species um, sold in markets use seagrass at some point in their life. 60% of fish uh, favored in households actually use seagrass at some point in their life cycle, either as juveniles or their bread there or as adults. And 68% uh, of fishermen fish in seagrass this is also true for surveys run in Africa, not just Indonesia. You know, in Africa, 60 to 70% of fishermen in social surveys there say they prefer to fish in seagrass meadows. So having this type of statistics really shines the spotlight on how integral seagrass is in providing food for us. Us can also regulate diseases, and this is a more recent finding, which I find to be a really cool finding actually. Um, in 2011, a group of coral scientists gathered in Sulawesi, Indonesia for a coral reef workshop. Not sure what they were actually studying in that coral reef workshop, but they gathered there and they all went snorkeling. And all of them came down with dysentery, which severe diarrhea and vomiting. And this was likely because of the sewage from the surrounding areas, which was very unfortunate for this group of, uh, of, group of scientists. But it was very fortunate for seagrass science because one of the PhD students there, Jolie Lam, went back to Sulawesi a few years later to pursue her hypothesis. She thought that maybe seagrass had the ability to reduce bacteria in water. So she collected samples, water samples, from four coral reefs with seagrass and four coral reefs <clears throat> without seagrass to check on the amount of enterococcal bacteria in them which is bacteria from the human gut. And this is what she found. In coral reefs with seagrass, um, there was 50% less enterococcus bacteria. There was 50% less of other pathogens that could cause diseases in fish and, and shellfish actually. Oops. And there was overall 50% uh, prevalence of uh, coral diseases when there was seagrass around. So really, if there, is seagrass, if there is seagrass on a coral reef, it is likely that the water is cleaner and that there will be less coral diseases and less diseases afflicting our seafood. I think that's a fantastic point to make in terms of the ecosystem services of seagrasses to humanity. Seagrass is also a blue carbon ecosystem uh, with blue carbon here referring to the carbon trapped and stored by marine ecosystems such as mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass. Now, carbon capture happens because these plants photosynthesize and they take up carbon dioxide in the process. And that carbon dioxide is converted to carbon that is stored in the plant biomass for a long time, and especially in the sediment. So this means that that unit of carbon that is not released to the atmosphere but it's instead stored in the carbon, um, it doesn't have the potential to trap heat and cause climate warming anymore. So seagrass is an incredible blue carbon ecosystem because it has the ability to trap sediment particles in the water and hold them down in the sediment. 
And because of the waterlogged conditions underwater, all that carbon is not oxidized easily and it's, it is kept out of the atmosphere. So despite covering only well around 0.2% of the ocean's area, seagrasses store up to 10% of the ocean's carbon. And on a per hectare basis, seagrass stores double the amount of carbon than terrestrial forests. So what I've given you are some little teasers about seagrass services uh, to humanity. But our problem here in Malaysia was that the data was from other locations and people felt very little connection to those studies, although they were highly valued in the scientific community. So despite the best science available to us, sometimes people will only believe a data set if it originates from their own country or their own specific seagrass meadow. So that was the problem for me when I started working in Malaysia, uh, when I was trying to increase the public profile of seagrass. And also people were way more interested in coral reefs than seagrass. There was plenty of coral reef restoration projects. There was a coral reef bleaching action plan. You know, people were very actively involved in it. Um, uh, tourists would come to Malaysia to dive just for spectacular coral reefs. So which is a wonderful thing because coral reefs deserve that kind of attention. But I'm a seagrass scientist, so what could I do about it? So I decided, or our team decided, we were going to leverage on the public affection for coral reefs by doing a combined project on their ecosystem services. At that time, the perception here was that coral reefs are great fish habitats and seagrass, not so much. I didn't know the truth, what, you know, I didn't know which was better at that time. So we decided to come up with a project to test this idea. How do coral reefs and seagrass compare uh, as fish habitats? Is it really true that seagrass are inferior fish habitats that are somehow not used by fish? I'd like to give credit to Nina Ho, the master's student who worked on this project and who did a fantastic job on it. So the study site I will be referencing is on the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia. If you look at this, A and B, uh, and, uh, it, uh, and this lie within the Sultan Iskandar Marine Park. So these islands are protected. So this is the first island, Babi Besar Island, and Tinggi Island. Uh, Babi Besar means big pig because there used to be a lot of pigs around on that island left there by sailors who would sail off uh, and then come back to hunt the pigs for food. But now that's not a practice anymore. And Tinggi Island, uh, because Tinggi means tall because it has a tall peak that was used for navigation by sailors. So, and the dots that you see on the map are the sampling stations for Nina, which I will tell you about in the next slide. So what she did was, she put down remote underwater video stations or RUVs. And these were basically just GoPro cameras that we put out uh, uh, and to capture the, the type of fish and the quantity of fish that were visiting our quadrants. And our quadrants were two meter by two meters in size. So we sampled 31 quadrants in corals and 30 quadrants in seagrass with each quadrant being recorded for 80 minutes. And these are the fish variables we now recorded, categorized as diversity and abundance variables. We, she measured all this, and also habitat function variables. She measured all this, and economic groups. She categorized the species as whether they were uh, important uh, for commercial fisheries or aquaria or as artisanal species. And these are examples of snapshots from seagrass. We saw a lot of these. We actually came across a, a lot of footage with turtles either swimming around in the seagrass meadow or the turtles actually eating in the quarter itself, which was pretty cool. These are examples of snapshots from coral reefs. So you can see that it was actually quite um, easy to identify them to family, genus, and species level. So on the right would be the data for seagrass and on the left, the data for coral reefs. We found 86 fish taxa in seagrass and 136 fish taxa in corals. And there was significantly higher fish density in coral reefs than seagrass and higher fish species density in coral reefs than in seagrass. So, okay, at this point uh, of the project, when the results came out, I was starting to get worried because I was thinking, oh no, am I making it worse for seagrass or not? 
But then when we looked at the fish family composition, things started becoming more interesting for seagrass. Because in seagrass, the top 75% of fish family species had greater variety in seagrass compared to coral reefs. And I'll talk more about this later. The fish population in seagrass was dominated by juveniles, 76%, as opposed to only 23% uh, uh, adults in seagrass. But in coral reefs, there was eight times more adult fish than juveniles. So clearly, there was a flip in the age structure of fish in these two ecosystems. And at this point, I was thinking, this is getting really exciting for seagrass in Malaysia. The most frequently found fish in coral reefs were bright, pretty species, you know. Um, uh, for instance, the ones that we found in every quadrant all the time was the black and gold chromis, butterfly fish and damsel fish were also found in very high frequency. These were the top three. And in seagrass, we found uh, these kind of fish, the ones that the, were the most frequently occurring were the emperor fish, goat fish, and brim. And this made us sit back and think for a while because you see, in coral reefs, there was the fish that we found there were all species that were really beautiful. They were pretty, they were bright colored. And this is why I think a lot of people thought that coral reefs were areas where there was a lot more fish. But you see the type of species found here were more associated with aquarium fish. Whereas the type of uh, fish species found in seagrass were not very flamboyant or colorful or, no, or easily noticed, but they were the fish that the local communities told us they would eat. So this was exciting for us because there is great beauty in coral reefs in terms of the fish that inhabit coral reefs. But seagrass has a bigger role than expected in putting food on our table. So basically, seagrasses are important for juvenile fish, where fish are birthed and nursed in, and then they leave for coral reefs once they have attained a certain size. And this has led to the idea that seagrasses are the kindergartens of the sea. So really, seagrass and coral reefs have complementary functions. They are not separate ecosystems. And if one cares about coral reefs, then seagrasses should also be in the equation. But as you have realized, we didn't just study the ecosystem services of seagrass in provisioning, but we put it on the back of coral reefs. In fact, this is an actual strategy for seagrass scientists. So one of the recommendations of this paper by Lina Nordland in 2018, when they consulted with 38 seagrass experts from all around the world, um, they suggested that we should investigate seagrass ecosystem services by comparing the delivery of services among different coastal habitats. So in my case, there was a, a lot of care and attention given to coral reefs. So we targeted comparing seagrass to coral reefs. Now, how has this played out for us? There has been some interest, way more than when we just tried to study seagrass alone, for sure. But still, fish and food didn't exactly get the media or policymakers excited about seagrass. They were excited, but still not enough. So this brings me to our next project, the dugong. The dugong is a marine mammal, also known as the sea cow. It is vulnerable on the IUCN red list, so there's a lot of attention on it, a lot of conservation attention on it. It was not very well known in Malaysia at that time, but most importantly, it was a media darling. I don't know, maybe there's something about a dugong's face and its association with mermaids maybe that makes it really attractive to the media. I'd like to uh, give credit to our student, Harris, who did all the great work with this project and did a tremendous job with it. So the diet of the dugong is made up almost entirely of seagrass. And we saw it firsthand when we did a necropsy on a, on a dead male dugong in 2006. Uh, this adult male had a full stomach. Uh, we dissected it and we found it full of seagrass. It also had a piece of seagrass stuck in its throat at its time of death. So clearly they need seagrass. They, they, they are seagrass specialists. And in Malaysia, 
we had dugong researchers working on finding out where the center of the dugong population was. So in 2016, they approached me. These were people from the Mariset Research Organization, a local NGO dedicated to the conservation of marine mammals in Malaysia. And they had done aerial surveys, uh, as you can see from, this, from the lines on these maps here. And this is the east coast of uh, Peninsular Malaysia. And all these lines that you see are the aerial surveys. So they knew where the dugong hotspots were, but they wanted to find out where the dugongs were feeding. So all these dots show uh, the dugong group size and whether it was mother and calf. And you can see that these are the islands where I was working on in terms of my in terms of the seagrass uh, work that I've been doing. Um, so the dugong people wanted to find out where the dugongs were feeding. So we got together and we decided to use the dugong as a flagship species to call for attention to seagrass meadows. And for me, it was more of a way of gathering more evidence for just how significant these meadows were for supporting populations of iconic animals. I thought maybe then people might start paying attention to seagrass. There were two questions we were interested in. Uh, firstly, what is the size of the meadow? Because actually we didn't even know where the meadow was at the time. And the second question, are there dugong feeding hotspots in the seagrass meadow? And the second question was particularly interesting because we wanted to prioritize areas for protection, seeing that there was a community living in the marine park islands. And instead of telling people to stay away from the whole seagrass meadow, we wanted to see if there were specific areas we needed to protect more than others. So um, these questions were addressed by using the spatial approach, by mapping the seagrass border, and by mapping dugong feeding trails. Uh, which is what you see here. When dugongs feed, they swim slowly along the sea bottom and dig up the seagrass in their mouths. So this creates a bare strip of area, which we call the dugong feeding trails. So we were interested in mapping this. And this is how we did it. Our approach was to drag a video camera in waterproof housing from a boat to capture footage of the sea floor. And GPS readings were taken along the way so that every frame had a geographic coordinate associated with it. And this camera, this is the camera here, uh, is, a, is attached to, to a frame with wings so that it is fairly stable in the water. And these are some of the screen grabs showing what it looks like on the, on the monitor. So we came across a lot of uh, moments of turtles feeding and then getting scared away by our cameras. And this is what it looks like top side. The camera below is attached to this 50 meter long cable and you have you need up two to three people pulling this cable. And what this person is looking at is the monitor to see what's, what's underwater. So this is our study site. This is Cebu Island. And this map shows an example of our transect. It's around eight kilometers from this end to this end. And we had a, we tried to get sort of a gridded configuration, which depended on water depth. So in total, we collected about 22 kilometers of transects in each sampling uh, season, which we sampled in June of 2016, October 2016, and uh, May of 2017. And it would take us about five to six days to complete uh, all these transects. And what this revealed was, um, it revealed a large continuous meadow off Cebu Island and with up to four species growing together. And this meadow was around 12 uh, square kilometers in size when we, started the, when we uh, started the survey. To give you an idea of what the seagrass landscape was like, uh, we, we uh, characterized the number of feeding trails per video frame and also the percentage cover of seagrass, but I'm not going to look at that right now. But what, what I will tell you is that to answer our question about whether there are dugong feeding hotspots, we uh, characterized the Moran's Eye Index to see whether the dugongs were feeding in a, in a random pattern or whether they were feeding in a clustered pattern. And if it's clustered, then we would have to look for the reason. It would mean that if dugongs that mean, if dugongs were feeding in a clustered way, it would mean that not all the seagrass meadow was equally attractive to the dugong. And we would have to find out why they were finding some spots more attractive than others. So Moran's eye told us that the pattern was indeed clustered and this was statistically significant. 
And yes, we, using this method, we did manage to find dugong feeding hotspots. And in some area, in the dugong feeding hotspots areas, we had more than 24 dugong feeding trails per hectare. And we used the um, Gaddis or GI star statistic to delineate feeding hotspots and cold spots. Um, and what I'd like to show you here is that all those in red are hotspots. And what we mean by hotspots is not just density of feeding trails. A hotspot is defined as a pixel, which is this rectangular units in here. A hotspot is defined as a pixel with a high number of feeding trails in it but it is also surrounded by neighboring pixels with equally high number of feeding trails. Whereas the ones in blue are cold spots. So cold spots are areas where the number of feeding trails in those pixels are very low and they are surrounded by neighbors with equally low feeding trails. So this is what we mean by high, high and low, low. So in summary, there were feeding clusters in all sampling seasons as shown by the red pixels and the hot, but the hotspots always seem to be in this uh, area here, never up here. And the cold spots always seem to be on the edges of meadows. So might it be possible that dugongs prefer to graze more in the central areas of meadows? We don't, we don't know yet for sure, but those were some of the initial questions we asked. So at least now, we know that dugongs pick and choose certain areas for more intensive feeding. And they do indeed have favorite feeding areas within the broader meadow. But what are the reasons? What makes a feeding hotspot a hotspot? So are they targeting dense seagrass areas? That's what we're trying to find out now, actually. Are they targeting seagrass with specific nutritional value? Um, are they avoiding predators? We are not doing that, unfortunately. Are they gardening? Uh, gardening means when they come back to a certain patch of seagrass repeatedly in order to make sure that the species they want, which are pioneering species, always grow back. So they keep on removing it so that it comes back again. So that's dugong gardening for you. So whatever it is, um, the outcome of this project in terms of its ecosystem services is our research collaborator, which is Mariset, has been lobbying for the area to be gazetted as a dugong sanctuary. And, uh, and this is possible only because, um, and this would actually enable seagrasses to get the protection that they deserve, but on the back of dugongs, because we use dugongs as key ecotourism attraction and dugongs as flagship species for seagrass conservation. So what's the take home message? The take home message is that Seagrasses need public affection. And, and I'm, it's not just public attention. They actually need affection. Affection in the sense that we need people to care about seagrasses because of, of how instrumental they are in, in our oceans. And one of the ways of getting the public to be, uh, to feel some form of connection to seagrass is to use ecosystem, ecosystem services as a tool because there is an explicit link between seagrasses and the services that they provide to humanity, either through providing food or ecotourism. Comparative studies are useful because we knew that coral reefs were what caught people's attention. Therefore, we came up with studies on seagrass that compared them to coral reefs. Um, and, and you don't just have to compare them in the way they did it. We did it because we did to fit the Malaysian situation, but you could actually do, do ecosystem connectivity studies, you know, between coral reefs and seagrass, between uh, seagrass and mangroves and, and so on and so forth, in order to make people sit up and take more notice of them. And lastly, faunal studies are useful. For some reason or other, people are not as interested in plants as they are in fauna. And this is one of the brick walls I feel myself hitting my head against. I talk about seagrass, you know, and, and the plant kingdom is an amazing kingdom and people sh should immediately fall in love with it. That's how I feel. But that's not the case with in many situations here. But I find that when we talk about fauna, animals, people get excited about it. So for seagrass, we use that to our advantage. We took, you know, fish and dugongs and attached them to seagrass. And with that, we hope that people would become more interested and more affectionate towards seagrass. So I would like to thank my collaborators. 
uh, interns and volunteers, and especially the two students on this project, Nina and Harris. Um, and with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jillian, uh, for your insightful presentation. Uh, I request uh, my, our participants to post questions if they have any. I'm sure some of you must be curious to know more. Okay, let me take the first question. Um, it's from Dr. Kisnet. He has asked, do dugongs target specific seagrasses or are they random grazers? Thank you, Kish, for that question. That's exactly what uh, Harris and our team is trying to find out. Um, but basically, with the work that we've been doing, we've, we found that they don't seem to target specific seagrass. Previously, people used to think that they would target the smaller seagrass over the larger seagrass. But in the meadows uh, where we work in, with those four seagrass species, they seem to be targeting quantity over species. It may be different in other meadows around the world that have a wider range of seagrass species, but this is what we found in our meadow. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, asked by Ms. Shreya Kumari is, what is the greatest threat to seagrass? I've highlighted land reclamation and water pollution, but if you were to ask me what is the greatest threat, I would have to say ignorance, uh, you know, and lack of knowledge, I think, because um, the, the way to capture the public attention and to direct the attention towards seagrass is to, you know, help is to increase their knowledge about seagrass in the first place. If we don't know an organism or an ecosystem, it's very hard to care about it. And it's very hard to be concerned about cutting down pollution or reducing land reclamation. So I would say that, you know, um, that not knowing about seagrass, the lack of information about seagrass, the lack of knowledge we have and our perceptions of it, that would be one of the greatest threats we have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jillian. Um, I would like to ask one question uh, from my side. Uh, we always uh, talk about sea plants and uh, their role in carbon fixation. That's, that's one thing which all, we always talk about when we uh, discuss climate change and all the uh, ways in which oceans help us. So what is, has there been any studies to quantify uh, seagrasses contribution in carbon uh, fixation, carbon fixation? Yes, um, uh, as of 10 to, 10 to 12 years ago is when seagrass scientists started paying attention to carbon sequestration in seagrass meadows. And um, so we have we have had pretty systematic guidelines about how to quantify seagrass capture and carbon sequestration in seagrass meadows. And that's when uh, we've actually found out that seagrasses sequester um, a, a huge amount, you know, I think it's like 1.9 billion tons of carbon the world over. And, and seagrasses are able to sequester carbon at 20 to 40 times a faster rate than terrestrial forests which is pretty amazing. And the work is still going on because not all seagrasses are the same. Like mm -hmm. some seagrasses may sequester more carbon than others. So, so I, people are still finding that out, you know. But just a point of interest, since you asked about, you know, carbon capture and climate change, an ecosystem is uh, effective as, as a carbon sequestration ecosystem if it can hold the carbon in it for a longer period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that seagrasses, seagrass is the longest living, uh, is the longest lived organism on the face of the earth. There are seagrass plants in the Mediterranean, Posidonia, 
Macedonia Oceanica, that some people think are up to 100,000 years old and might actually be 200,000 years old. So you imagine this, they can live for so long, it means that they are holding down all that carbon and sequestrating it for that length of time, which I find to be phenomenal. That's amazing to know. Um, we have many more questions. Okay, another uh, question from Shreya Kumari again. Uh, she has asked, uh, how can she get public attention uh, with regard to seagrass? Okay, she wants some advice from you. Yes, I guess, um, I guess if you want public attention to seagrass, you could uh, s start by directing some of your all, all of your work towards understanding seagrass ecosystem services. So, uh, you know, uh, try, to, try to find out how seagrasses contribute in terms of providing food, in terms of uh, carbon sequestration, in terms of contributing to culture and way of life in the community. If you can find that link, you know, of how they serve humanity, you're more likely to be able to raise attention for seagrasses. Previously, I used to work on very fundamental stuff. You know, I used to do seagrass mapping. I used to look at how different species uh, uh, coexist with each other. Nobody was interested in that. It was really hard for me to get attention. But then when I directed my work towards ecosystem services, that's when at least some, you know, uh, there was growing attention towards seagrass, at least in Malaysia. Well, that's one of the perils of utilitarian attitude towards everything in nature. Um, we, have, <laughs> we have another question from uh, Adila Fawzi. Uh, she's asking, uh, do we know what are the drivers for seagrass diversity within a region? That is, is it the substrate composition, ocean currents, local variation in seawater nutrients? What is it? Oh. It's probably all of that. And that's the million dollar question that we are trying to find out actually. Um, so with seagrass, um, light and temperature would be the two main things that, that determine where a species is able to survive and what type of species can survive where. But um, it's, we are beginning to realize that it's not just the physical characteristics, you know, like temperature and light and salinity and substrate. We are beginning to realize that it, um, species diversity and distribution is also driven by competition between other species. It's also driven by whether, whether the fish and the dugongs and turtles actually are able to eat the seagrass seeds and disperse them elsewhere. So it's also that the biological communities as well play a part in, in dispersing them and in making sure that certain species can reach areas that are suitable for seagrass. So it's all those physical characteristics mentioned, but it's also the biological associations, um, biological communities that exist in a certain area. Thank you. Uh we have another question from uh, Ms. Cheryl Rita. She's asked, what would be, in your opinion, the way forward to enhance seagrass protection, especially in Johor waters? That's, I believe, a specific region. Uh, considering the numerous threats and challenges faced there. Yes, the way forward would be to engage more with local communities. Uh, right, now, um, right now, our team of scientists, uh, you know, I think the team of scientists, people who work on seagrass and dugongs, I think a, a, a lot of uh, work has been done on trying to understand how important seagrasses are. But I think that we need to reach out more to local communities to engage them and to pass on all this knowledge and information to them. I think we could do a lot more with that. And one of the other things is, uh, is not just local communities uh, who, whom I feel would then you know, uh, call more attention uh, and put pressure on like local representatives to actually come up with policies that are advantages to seagrasses. But I also feel that if we, if we direct our work towards ecosystem services, 
and we find that our work comes up showing that sea glasses are important, we, the next step would be for us to reach out in a stronger way to policymakers, to politicians, to tell them about the ecosystem services that is affecting their constituencies. I think that would be the next step for us in Johor, strengthening it from a policy point of view. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have another question from uh, one of our students. Uh, she wants to know what actually seagrasses do to regulate diseases that you mentioned during the talk. What seagrasses do to regulate diseases? I think if you're talking about the uh, enterococcal bacteria in water, right? Yeah. Yes. You see, when, yeah, when, when uh, the authors of that paper, Jolie Lamb, when they hypothesized that seagrasses were probably having an effect on the bacteria, that they were not really sure what it was exactly, what the mechanism was. Was it the seagrasses taking up the bacteria, which I, we don't think so? Or was it something, was the seagrass supporting some kind of organism like anemones, for instance, you know, that were taking up uh, uh, the, the bacteria? And that might be more likely but what it is exactly, what the mechanism is, is not known yet. But I do know that there are researchers now looking at, at the filter feeders, you know, um, looking at filter feeders in seagrass meadows to see whether, how, whether and how they play a role in reducing pathogens in seawater. So I would say that the key to that would be in the filter feeding organisms that are supported by seagrass meadows. Okay, that's interesting. Um, just a note on that. I want to know, since seagrasses are also uh, angiosperms, aquatic angiosperms, right? So uh, many of the land angiosperms, they are known to uh, produce several defense uh, molecules, which can act against or alkaloids, for example. They can act against various bacteria. Can that be a possibility in the case of seagrass? It, it might be, I, do, I have not heard very much about work done in that area. Maybe it's because it's so uh, difficult to actually uh, quantify the uh, chemical compounds <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> underwater. So I would imagine that that would be a factor, but I haven't heard very much about what has been done in terms of that. It's quite a new area of uh, research. so. Uh, understandable. Yes. Uh, another question from uh, Cecilia Chu. She is asked, do you know of any seagrass database, even our seagrass database for public? Great question, Cecilia. Uh, you want, sounds like you want to look at species distribution, which is great. Yes, uh, there is, a, you could look at GBIF, um, you could look uh, at the, the Seagrass Atlas of the World database, uh, which probably has another name, I'm not, it's not coming to mind, but probably the WCMC database that has um, data points, spatial data points with GPS coordinates and all uh, for seagrasses, but you could also consider uh, an, a citizen scientist app called Seagrass Spotter. And that's, that's an app that people have on their phones that was launched, I think, about two and a half to three years ago, where citizen scientists, you, me, anyone, can go out to Seagrass Meadow and you can actually take a photo of it and upload it to the app and, and uh, the species will be identified by experts. So I do believe that that app actually has data that is downloadable. So if you find that you go to GBIF or some of the other, uh, or OBIS maybe, and you find that there are some data points that maybe are you know, not enough data points, you could probably think of Seagrass Spotter as uh, another option. Thank you. Um, another question from a participant. Uh, they've asked, what are the measures played by the world authorities to save seagrass? What are the 
measures taken up by the world authority? World authority meaning the United Nations? Probably. Uh, probably. <laughs> probably. The various governments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because SIGAS had, you know, since 1990, since 1998, actually, SIGAS scientists from around the world have been lobbying for attention for SIGAS. And every decade, we stop and we check ourselves and we say the same thing, still not enough attention. And I think it was in 2016 was the last effort where SIGAS scientists got together to petition the United Nations uh, to, to tell the United Nations and the global community about how important SIGAS are. And one of the ways they wanted to increase the profile of seagrasses was to have the 1st of March designated as the United Nations World Seagrass Day. But that hasn't been declared yet. It's still very much in the works. Uh, so in terms of how important are seagrasses to the World Authority and what measures are being taken, I think as a global community, we have not really taken any steps yet. But the seagrass scientific community is, and their main strategy has been to try to increase attention by putting a lot of news about seagrass out on social media, uh, sharing uh, apps such as the Seagrass Spotter app for citizen scientists and calling on the United Nations to declare a World Seagrass Day on the 1st of March. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Aparna Nodia. Is there any medicinal importance of seagrass? Not that I know of. There have been, actually come to think of it, quite a lot of researchers from India have actually tried to look at that. Um, I think they've, uh, they've tried to look at the anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, anti-bacterial properties. And it's found, I, I, I think, um, that some species of seagrass were found to have antibacterial and antiviral properties. Um, some of my colleagues here in Malaysia tried to look at the anti-diabetic and anti-cancer uh, properties, but it was really hard because the volume of seagrass that we needed to sample just to do the chemical screening was so much that we couldn't take that much uh, volume of seagrass from a marine protected area. So that project here in Malaysia kind of died out after a while, though it started out in a very promising way. So, uh, so yes, uh, that, there have been studies on the antiviral and antibacterial compounds of seagrasses, though. Okay. Um, another question we have from Dr. Madhurani. Um, as the seagrass meadows are degrading at an alarming rate, how can we increase the cultivation and restore uh, its population or diversity? Yes. Um, how can we restore? Well, firstly is we've got to start preventing the land development and pollution and all the weak policies that are contributing to seagrass loss. So prevention for me is, is the main thing that we should be thinking about. But I know in some instances, prevention is not the only recourse for us. We have to talk about restoration and rehabilitation and transplantation. So it is, it would be possible in some cases, um, I think uh, we would need to do transplantation and restoration of seagrass meadows by actually planting, planting seagrass out in areas that they used to exist, but no longer are at anymore. And I think that there's a lot of potential for work on seagrass restoration to be done the world over. It's just that it has to be done in a responsible way. It, we have to do it in a way where we always put prevention of decline first as the main measure instead of restoration. Because a lot of people feel that once you are successful in restoration, that gives you a license to destroy the, to destroy the seagrass meadows because you can always transplant it back. But I'd like to stress here that in the 15 year history of seagrass restoration, oh no, 25 year seagrass restoration efforts that have been done the world over, the rate of success is very low. Most studies on restoration of seagrass around the world have had success rates of less than 35%. So there are risks associated with seagrass restoration. Um, we have another question from uh, Rajini Kumari. Uh, she wants to know where 
exactly these seagrass grow on the sea plain or uh, any part of the ocean? I, I suppose she wants to know about the distribution, ecological distribution. Yes, they grow in water that has enough sunlight for them because they are photosynth photosynthesizers. So in, um, in, in Malaysia, for example, they grow from the intertidal zone, that means pretty close to the beach, right down to about 10 to 15 meters, as long as the water is clear enough for them to live in. So <clears throat> they are considered to be mainly shallow water ecosystems. Although I did point out in the talk that there are some uh, deep water seagrass as well that grow down to 70 meters or 150 meters, but that is uh, uh, not the norm. That is more uh, a rarity rather than the norm. Most of it is, uh, most of the substrate would be sandy, muddy substrate that is in shallow water. Okay. Um, we have another question from Dr. Brajesh Dvivedi, uh, who wants to know what is the biomass profile of seagrass? The biomass profile of seagrass. Hmm. Um, there is a, a great, for most seagrasses, there, some of the small seagrasses, their biomass is very, very uh, small, like less than 10 grams. Uh, and, most of, and most of the biomass is in the underground rather than the above ground for seagrasses. So it's, top, uh, it's uh, bottom heavy in terms of the biomass. Uh, the roots and rhizomes are a lot heavier and there's a lot more mass underground rather than above ground. Thank you. Um, I'm going to club a, a couple of related questions. There are questions about, uh, and people are curious to know uh, if uh, seagrass has the capacity to uh, absorb uh, heavy metals or other pollutants. Yes, there have been studies done on that and they do have the capacity to. Um, and I think uh, there, needs to be, there needs to be more work done on that actually because this shows, showcases their potential in coming up with nature-based solutions in cleaning and purifying water uh, for meadows that occur in polluted areas. So yes, there have been um, uptake of uh, heavy metals and uptake of organic chemicals for, for sure they have been done. Uh, Santosh Kumar wants to know if uh, seagrass are biological indicators. Yes, uh, they are regarded as biological indicators. Um, uh, usually, if an area is really, really polluted with organic waste, um, the seagrasses tend to disappear or decline quickly, and they tend to be replaced with seaweed, macroalgae instead. So if we see a whole lot of seaweed suddenly appearing, and covering the seagrasses and the seagrasses getting thinner and thinner and lower in density, then we kind of know that, yes, there is some kind of eutrophication that's going on in an area. And in some areas, uh, certain species of uh, seagrass can only live in really clear water. So then we would use those as biological indicators. Thank you. Um... Another participant, Niti Yadav, she wants to know if you can suggest some uh, authentic online source for identification of seagrass. Authentic online sources for identification of seagrasses. You could try the Seagrass Watch, um, the Seagrass Watch website that is online. They have a citizen scientist manual um, that's uh, pretty easy to, to uh, look at because it's made for citizen scientists, but it's also suitable for scientists. In tropical areas, like in Malaysia, we only have 15 to 16 species. So it's not like coral reefs uh, or, or even mangroves where, where identification is a problem. So we are able to use actually the Seagrass Watch uh, manual to actually identify the species level. Um, there's another resource for identification, but it's not online. That's uh, the Seagrass Methods book, but, but that's in a hard copy form. It's not like free for use on online, but that's the one with really good 
um, taxonomic uh, taxonomic keys for how to identify and differentiate between species, especially the holophilus. The holophila, the small spoon-shaped ones, those are the ones that are not so easy to identify, actually. Thank you. Um, the, the same person has actually asked if we can use these seagrass for water purification treatment. Probably, yes, I would, I would think so. Since because of the antibacterial properties you said they have. Yeah, yes, I, I would think so. And, and I think uh, coming from the Jolie Lamb paper in Nature that talked about that, the antibac you know, reducing bacteria and all, <clears throat> I would think that this opens up the opportunity for us to, <clears throat> when we talk about maintaining a seagrass meadow or restoring it, to talk about it as being an, a water purifier that serves the community. So I think that's to totally you know, one of the potentials for seagrass. Yes, a, a, a promising new area of research, perhaps. Um, uh, Dr. Monica Ram wants to know, uh, does coral bleaching affect seagrass productivity? Does coral bleaching affect seagrass productivity? I would assume that if, um, if a seagrass grows on or near a coral reef, um, the coral reef has certain functions for the seagrass as well. It provides shelter for seagrass seedlings um, and it uh, provides a sand and sediment, you know, creates new sand and sediment for seagrasses. So I would assume that if coral bleaching happens and a reef nearby a seagrass meadow starts to break down, this would actually lead to changes in the seagrass meadow as well in terms of water chemistry and in terms of uh, the amount of sediment that lands on the seagrass because the coral reefs are no longer there to protect it. So, so I'm not sure how bleaching itself directly would affect seagrass, but I would imagine that if coral bleaches and the structure then gets fragmented and breaks down, there would be some sort of an effect on seagrasses because as we've seen, they seem to be connected better than, you know, better than we expect them to be. But because there's not been a lot of work done on how they actually affect each other, so I, I'll, this is just a guess for me. Thank you. But perhaps that's again another uh, promising area of research. So students can take note of these. Um, I'm going to next club a couple of questions together. Uh, Mahesh Bhardwaj wanted to know if seagrass could be harvested in lab. Uh, perhaps he wants to know whether they can be grown in lab. Um, Niti Yadav uh, wants to know if we can grow these seagrass in aquacultures or hydroponics or if they require any specific growth medium. Yes, they can be grown very easily in the lab, um, especially the smaller tropical species. I'm not so well versed with the large species uh, and, and how growing large species in the lab, but certainly the, the smaller tropical species that we find uh, a lot in, in the Indo-Pacific region, we've been able to grow that quite successfully in the lab. Uh, you don't really need any specific medium. If you take the, the sample with a plug, that means you know, with some of the sediments still stuck to its roots, so, you know, so um, because that's the environment that it's used to, and you grow it in the lab in generic sediment, it usually is able to grow very well. Actually, it's an easy plant to culture as long as you keep its root system healthy. Okay. Um, um, I hope you are not tired, Dr. Jillian, because uh, questions are flowing in. That's great. Um, that's great. So, um, uh, okay, in between, uh, just taking a break from the question, I would like to, uh, be, uh, considering some of the questions entails uh, more discussion, in-depth discussion with you, they probably are looking for some guidance. Uh, can, you, can you give some sort of contact information later on maybe? Uh, so that's... Sure. 
still can get in touch with you. Yeah. So another question from, I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. If not, uh, my apologies. Pung Ki In uh, wants to know uh, if can if seagrass can be used as a tool to mitigate eutrophication impacts from aquaculture or resort sewage. Um, considering that they are able to take up nutrients, they are able to filter water, they are able to hold sediment down so that um, the water gets clearer, I would imagine that would be one of the functions for, of seagrasses. However, I think there is a limit to it because they don't do so well in eutrophicated areas. So if the aquaculture um, if the aquaculture facility is the type where eutrophication is not a problem, then I would imagine it would be seagrasses would be able to serve some sort of purpose like what you imagine. But in areas that are really eutrophicated, you know, uh, very high uh, turbidity and very high organic matter, it might be a problem. The seagrasses may not be able to grow well enough to fulfill their function in filtering the water. So it really de depends on, when you, on the quality of the water, on the quality of the effluent. Next question is from Nurul Siaza Akila. She wants to, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I really, I apologize. He or she um, is doing some internship at Perhentian Island. Uh, as we know that green turtles uh, eat seagrass, what method or suggestion uh, can you give so that they can trace the population of seagrass? So some yes. research-based question. <laughs> well, um, for, uh, for instance, in our project with the dugongs, we didn't know, how, you know where the seagrass was but we followed the dugongs. So we followed the herbivores. And um, in, the, in, the, in the Chagos Islands in the Pacific, you know, uh, actually a group of researchers from the UK also tagged turtles, nesting turtles, uh, green turtles, I believe, uh, in the Chagos uh, Islands. And they followed them. And that's how they discovered new deep water seagrass right in the middle of the Indian Ocean where nobody ever goes and nobody knew about those seagrass. So for you as a seagrass um, researcher, I, you would, if you have uh, access to satellite tags, you know, for your turtles, I, I've heard that there's some work that's been going on there. Uh, if you were to tag and to look at the root of your turtles, you would probably be able to see where they spend a lot of time and those would be where your seagrass meadows are. Dr. Kishnet wants to know uh, if chemotaxonomy can be used to identify seagrass. Oh, I do not know. Um, there's been some work in the classical literature done on uh, chemical compounds in seagrass, but I don't think that it has gone to the level of chemotaxonomy. So Kishnev probably has opened up a Pandora's box here, <laughs> another potential research area. Um, so yeah, biochemists who would be interested in this, I would say, go ahead and look at that. But for, for in seagrass, um, I'm not so familiar. I've not really heard a lot about chemotaxonomy being used for seagrass. Uh, he's uh, put in a note saying uh, that he thinks uh, it's been probably used. So uh, you can continue the discussion for further yes, research. I will. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Dr. Sandeep Bajpai. Uh, who wants to know if sea grass can be used as a source of single cell protein and you know which is used as a food supplement as a food supplement um, why we would, would we want to use it as a food supplement 
Uh, is it because of uh, nutritional compounds like carbohydrates and protein and lignin or fiber? It, yeah, uh, he wants, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, he wants to know uh, whether it can be used as a source of single cell protein. Oh, I would not know about that. I'm so sorry. I would not know how to answer that question. Um, another question from uh, Mr. Devidas Kapadnes. He wants to know how fast uh, do seagrass grow? Uh, some of the small seagrass, like a spoon-shaped seagrass, they grow really fast, like sometimes one to two centimeters in a day. And there are others, the largest seagrass meadows, especially the temperate ones, they grow very slowly. Um, maybe just uh, you know, a few centimeters in a year. So it really depends. In the tropical areas of the Indo-Pacific region, which is where we are, that you can see very fast growth. Within one week, you can see changes. So when we monitor seagrass growth, um, about three to four days is enough for us to collect our sample to actually see changes in growth. Okay. Um Afendi Yang Amri uh, from IOES wants to know that since seagrass and coral reefs are adjacent to each other, they grow adjacent to each other, so do they compete for space? Well, they, they do grow adjacent to each other, um, but they need different kinds of substrate. A coral reef would probably need more hard substrate and the seagrass will probably need a softer substrate. So I don't really see too much of a competition between them. Um, I think that they are seagrass, uh, that seagrass and coral reefs uh, fill different spatial niches in the environment because they need uh, different types of substrate properties despite growing together. Um. I'll quickly take up a few more questions. We're left with a couple of minutes only. Um, Dr. Mohammed Rizman wants to know if there has been any population genetic studies on seagrasses in Malaysia. There, in Malaysia in particular, no, not yet. There have been some researchers from uh, Vietnam who have collaborated with Malaysians to look at just once, uh, to look at, I think, a few species, but they looked at it over a broad regional range and it was more for taxonomy, but specific to Malaysia, no. And I'm really, really hoping that a population geneticist would actually think of taking this up because I think a seagrass would be a perfect uh, model to look at how, um, to look at biogeography and to look at how water currents change and move between certain areas. Um, a, quick, a quick question from Amar Khan Kumar. He wants to know if we can grow seagrass in small ponds or rivers. He's referring to more uh, freshwater uh, bodies here, small ponds or rivers. Is it possible to grow them? Uh, not if it's freshwater, but there is one type of seagrass species that is more tolerant of um, freshwater, and that would be Rupia maritima. I haven't even seen it myself because I'm always looking at seagrass in the sea. But Rupia maritima apparently can live in very uh, low salinity water. So that it would be possible for Rupia, but maybe not so possible for other species. So uh, probably there, uh, there are species that grow in estuarine there are, yes. Areas. So the spoon, yes, the spoon-shaped okay. ones, they grow in estuarine areas, but they would still need like full seawater. Okay, yeah. to complete their life cycle. Yes, and uh, apart from Rupia maritima, if you are talk, if you, the, the other species that has a high chance of growing in fresh, near fresh water, like fresh, you know, uh, brackish water, would be the Holophila species, the spoon-shaped species because they, they have a very wide range of tolerance to salinity, as well as to light and temperature. So um, Holophila would be a good bet. Okay. Um, oh. okay, we have come to the end of our uh, 
session that's uh, allocated, the time allocated for question and answers. There are many more questions and I'm, uh, I'm, uh, apolog I apologize for not being able to take them up. Uh, and I thank you, Dr. Jillian, for patiently addressing all the questions. There has been a flood of questions. Uh, you have been immensely patient uh, with all the questions. Thank you very much once again from all the organizers and the participants as well. Uh, I now uh, request moving ahead with the session, I now request Dr. Sunita Malik to invite and introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Jillian. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubina and everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rubina, and a very good evening to one all present here. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rupesh Kumar Bhomia. Dr. Bhomia completed his Master's of Sciences at the School of Environmental Sciences at JNU in year 2003. He then attended Oxford University to conduct another Master's in Biodiversity, Conservation and Management. He holds a PhD in wetlands biogeochemistry from the University of Florida. During his diverse career, he has worked in research institutions like Indian Institute of Forest Management, in academic institutions like University of Florida and Oregon State University in USA, as well as in non-government organizations like World Wide Fund in India. At present, Dr. Bhomia is a scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research, which is CIFOR, based in Indonesia. He is working as blue carbon and climate change expert in the climate change, energy, and low carbon development group. His work focuses on freshwater peatlands and coastal mangrove ecosystems as potential options for designing nature-based solutions for climate change. During his Decade-long research career, he has conducted research in both freshwater and marine ecosystems. Notably, freshwater wetlands of Florida, Everglades, and Peruvian Amazonia, and coastal mangroves in India, Honduras, Liberia, Gabon, Ghana, Madagascar, and Senegal. Dr. Bhomia has many publications in eminent journals and book chapters to his credit and he is affiliated with prestigious societies like Soil Science Society of America, American Geophysical Union, Association for the Scientists in Limnology and Oceanography, Society of Wetland Scientists, along with many others. The title of Dr. Bhumia's talk today is Tropical Peach Swamp Forests, Why These Ecosystems Matter in a Fight Against Climate Change. An audience can write their queries in the chat box and they will be taken up after the talk in the question answer session. I now invite Dr. Bhumia to deliver his talk. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Thank you for such a long and <laughs> lengthy introduction. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity for all organizer, organizers, committee members for uh, this opportunity to share some of my work uh, that I have had a chance to carry out in the last few years. Uh, you have already shared uh, the title of my talk, so I will not repeat it here, but I'll try to share my screen here. Please let me know if the presentation is visible. It is so. Okay. Is it in full screen mode? Not yet, sir. Okay. How about now? Uh, yes, sir, now it is. Okay, great. Uh, is my voice clear? Loud yes. enough? Oh, okay, clear also, great. Sir. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, how much time do I have just to keep in track? Sir, uh, one hour uh, around. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today, I'll be taking you to the tour of tropical peat swamp forest, where I have an opportunity and chance to visit myself, collect some data and conduct some field work. And I would like to share those stories 
and uh, the importance of these ecosystems and why they are really, really an effective piece in our fight against climate change. So I have divided my talk in a few chunks. And this is the outline. First, I'll talk about peatlands. What are peatlands? How are they formed and where are they located? Then I will talk briefly about climate change, then role of peatlands in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And then briefly on the conservation and restoration of peatlands and some of the ongoing research, particularly focusing on C4, what we are doing uh, at C4 in context of peatlands. And then I'll leave you with some key takeaways. So what is peat? Um, I'm not sure if you all had an opportunity to visit a peatland or visit a forest which has peat in there, but peat is basically largely composed of plant remains, uh, mainly vascular plants and mosses, which are only partly decomposed in absence of oxygen due to water saturated conditions. So it's a long sentence, but I like to highlight two important factors. Peat is formed where there is organic matter deposited by mostly vegetation and it cannot decompose. So the conditions existing in this ecosystem doesn't allow these organic material to, uh, to decompose or mineralize. And so it accumulates over time and this semi-decomposed material is peat. If you look at this uh, figure on the top left of your screen, this is a core that has been taken from that kind of soil. And as you can see, this is how this semi-decomposed peat looks like. It's not your typical soil that uh, you are mostly familiar with. There's very little sediment uh, or mineral component in it. And the original parts of plant have lost their um, structure. So it's hard to tell whether it, this, this dark matter came from a leaf or a twig or a branch or a root. So it loses uh, its uh, shape or structure. But, and this is all possible because of water. So this saturated condition doesn't allow oxygen. And so the microbes that use oxygen, oxygen for decomposition are not active. And so over time, this material accumulates. If, uh, I don't know if you can see uh, this, uh, this person standing, uh, there's a saturated condition here, there's water here. Uh, in this picture also, uh, there's water on the floor. Here also you can see some of the water. So it doesn't need to be flooded like a river or deep, but the, the, the area remains saturated. Uh, and this picture on the right hand side shows some of the material that goes into forming this peat. So then with that elaborate uh, understanding of peat, you can, peatlands are simply the area or the land where peat is found. There are no globally accepted standard about the amount of in organic material uh, that is how much peat is there or what is the thickness of peat layer. So the, the percentage of carbon in that peat layer could vary as well as the thickness, but still if there is a presence of peat, then th that is called as peatland. Uh, in English language, there are various names for peatlands. You might have heard terms like mire, marsh, swamp, fen, and bog. All of those refers to peatlands and they all have one uh, uh, factor which is common. That is surface layer of peat formed mainly due to permanently waterlogged condition. So these are one or two key concepts to remember when you talk or, or, or discuss anything about peat or peatlands. How are peatlands formed? So there are, to understand, them, to understand how peatlands are formed, there, it can be divided into three stages of formation. You can relate it to the successional stages uh, in terms of forest, how over time vegetation develops. So in the case of peatlands, the first stage is uh, there's a depressional area on a landscape where water is retained. This could be water from rainfall or an overflow from a nearby river or a water body or uh, due to during monsoon season, there could be an influx of flow. So once this waterlogged area is completely saturated uh, with water, that is year round water is there, then uh, in, a, in an undisturbed forest setting, uh, vegetation come in, comes into play. And this is stage two, where marsh vegetation develops. These are specialized vegetation which can thrive in this wet environment. 
And as they grow, these vegetation, organic matter deposition happen in terms of leaf litter and also root biomass that grows as the plant thrives. Due to this saturated condition, the decomposition is almost absent and microbial degradation is very minimal. Some of the, the anaerobic bacteria and microbes can only function. Most of the aerobic bacteria, microbes or microorganisms are not active in this setting. Over time, the water color changes due to brownish black and the pH of this area uh, comes down. That also reduces further decomposition. The stage three, where, uh, is, which is considered as the developed peat stage, is where you have a fully specialized developed vegetation, which thrives well in, petland, in peatlands in this uh, earlier wetland conditions. And this layer basically build over itself. So there is a continuous influx of uh, organic matter in forms of a litter layer, but there is no loss. So there is uh, this accrual of this material and the peat layer grows. And over time, this takes the shape of kind of a dome in an area. So you might have heard term peat domes. This is a characteristic uh, shape. If you take a, a section of landscape, if you can think about imagining if you slice the landscape, this is how you will, uh, you will see uh, the peatlands typically have a, a sort of a convex structure with a higher area in the top and then radiating uh, radially, it kind of tapers down. And this formation of peat layer is very slow. So about half to two millimeters per year. This is how uh, much it grows. So I want to just bring back to a picture here if you see this, this is a, a core of peat. This is about 50 centimeters. So this, is, this was formed at least over a period of 500 years. Just to give you a perspective how slow uh, it grows and how important it is. So now, uh, after discussing how peat is formed um, uh, and what are the stages of its formation, it would be good to kind of look at the global distribution of peatlands. And this is a map which came out a few years ago, so not, not the most recent one, but it kind of uh, shows in green areas where peat is formed. And one interesting thing here is if you put the tropics here, then it differentiates uh, the two zones where uh, peatlands are formed. So if you see there is a chunk of peatlands distributed along tropical region, and then a bigger or larger chunk towards uh, temperate and tundra region. Uh, before I move to tropical peatlands, which is the focus of my uh, talk here, I just want to highlight one point that this is temperate at tundra region stores a vast amount of these carbon in these peatland. And since this is mostly frozen, the name, uh, the term they use is permafrost, this is locked away. But in the context of current uh, global warming, this is very vulnerable. Now, moving on to tropical peatlands, uh, you can see some of the countries where this is uh, kind of uh, mostly uh, formed or mostly discovered so far. Uh, these are the Amazon Basin in South America, the Central Kuwait region uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo and Congo, which is kind of in the center of Africa, and then Southeast Asian countries such as Malaysia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Uh, I will be talking mostly about tropical peatlands. So as you see, peatlands are distributed throughout the tropical world, uh, but majority of it occurs in Southeast Asia. So about 56% of uh, tropical peatlands are found in Indonesia and Malaysia combined. Uh, and then South America has about 24%, while Africa has 13%. A more recent uh, uh, fieldwork and study um, found a larger area of uh, peatland in Africa. So if we put in that into this figure, this 13% will probably grow. So what makes peatland so special? Uh, we learned that these are formed very slowly and formed when certain conditions exist on landscape. So it's not very easy to have peatlands everywhere. Uh, but still in our current context, why are so, uh, peatlands so important, so special? So in our con current context, if we talk about climate change, 
uh, peatlands are important because the organic matter that accumulated over thousands of years is stored in the thick layers of peatland or peat deposit. So these as a storehouse of this carbon rich organic layer in itself become uh, very important. And I will talk more on the, the context of climate change from next slide onward. So I believe here everyone uh, understands basics of climate change. And this is our one of the most uh, important contemporary challenges, challenge that is uh, humanity is facing. And there have been a lot of uh, research. There have been a lot of uh, talk on policy circles about addressing climate change. And one of the, the, the most uh, primary impact or primary repercussion of this climate change is global warming. So this figure here is a global map from NASA where they compared average surface temperature from 2011 to 2020, so almost a decadal uh, air temperature, compared to baseline average from 1951 to 1980. And these darker shades or warmer shades, if you will, the red, the, the orange, shows a much higher increase from the baseline values. And this, the, the lower part in the, uh, the, high, uh, the top part in this globe highlights what I mentioned about the vulnerability of uh, permafrost or the temperate peatlands. This will this area will see much higher increase in temperature. Has seen much higher increase in temperature, and the trend trend continues. When we come to the tropical regions here, a, you look at this is the uh, South America, northern part of South America. This is the central part of Africa, and this is Southeast Asia. These areas have also seen much higher increase in temperature over the past decade. When we look in the context of uh, global surface temperature increase and try to plot at some of the activities and try to situate what could be the drivers of these temp increased temperature over time. This graph again uh, from NASA um, observatory. Uh, I like this one particularly because uh, if you, there are three parts to this graph. One in the dark black is the line of observed temperature. And so across 1880s to 2020, you see after about 1960s, this line goes up at a very steep angle. This is showing how the temperature has constantly been increasing. This is uh, left y-axis is in Celsius and this side it's in Fahrenheit. If you want to divide this, this trend into human drivers and natural drivers, then the picture becomes much more clear. This green line underneath here shows the, the temperature changes uh, which can be attributed to natural drivers. So natural drivers could be say volcanic eruption, uh, any kind of natural wildfires and so on and so forth, which, which has contributed to this increase in temperature. But this in red color are shown human drivers. And you see this line follows exactly the trajectory of this increased temperature. What it shows is that human drivers or the human activities, which could be fossil fuel burning, which could be industrialization, which could be land use change, agriculture, so and so forth, are the primary reasons for which we see this temperature growing up. Having said so, what it shows is that the warming is uh, the largest driver of warming is emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, greenhouse gases predominantly carbon dioxide and methane, which comprises 90% of these greenhouse gases, 10% from nitrous oxides. So uh, I think I have kind of uh, the, the point here I'm trying to make is uh, that a lot of climate change uh, that we see or global warming that we see uh, is uh, it, it can be uh, attributed to the emissions of greenhouse gases. And what are uh, the impacts of this climate change and what are the actions that we can do? So some of the effects that you probably already know, but I've just listed here, that global warming leads to polarized melting, desert expansion, frequent heat waves and wildfires, heavy intense city of natural weather phenomena, storms, hurricanes, uh, so on and so forth, rising sea levels and high ocean temperatures. So in the last session, there was some talk about coral breaching and uh, ocean temperatures are considered to be one of the reasons. 
for ocean uh, for coral bleaching and ocean acidification as well. So many of these impacts are already felt at the current level of warming, which is about roughly 1.1 degrees Celsius. So these impacts are uh, clearly felt across the world, uh, mostly so by uh, people who are living maybe in areas which are disproportionately affected due to these changes. So in international intergovernmental panel on climate change ipcc projects a significant increase in these impacts as warming continues to 1.5 degrees celsius or more if no action is taken so if you have seen some of the projected reports by ipcc where they have different scenarios looking at the current trends how much the temperature is going to increase of the world if if no action is taken and all our international uh, agreements like Paris Agreement and uh, UNF, under UNFCCC aims to, to curb this increase in temperature below uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius or at the most below 2 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, the, the effects will be catastrophic. So this is what uh, we see. What can we do about... Uh, uh, what can we do in the context of uh, this increase in temperature uh, so that uh, climate change can be, uh, the impacts of climate change can be kind of mitigated. And there are two terms that come into play. One is mitigation, which means reducing greenhouse gas emissions and removing the already emitted greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So that component of uh, our actions is known as mitigation. Second component is adaptation. Adaptation basically means as human society, as well as the, uh, the rest of the uh, biological world has to adjust to the actual or experienced climate. So this basically takes into consideration that the changes in weather pattern, in climate, in various attributes are going to happen, but how best we can adapt uh, as humans, uh, human society can adapt, as well as for the other biodiversity of the planet, how, what can be done so that those species are also adapted to the changed climate. So these two aspects uh, form the bedrock of any climate action that we talk about, mitigation and adaptation. And I'm going to talk to you or trying to provide some of the aspects how peatlands can be used uh, as uh, important tools or components in both mitigation as well as adaptation strategies. So first one I'll touch upon some of the peatlands role in climate change mitigation. So peatlands cover less than 3% of global land surface. So a very small proportion of global land area is covered by peatlands. However, due to the thick deposits of, of carbon-rich organic layer or peat, these contain almost twice as much carbon as all world's forests. So this kind of give you uh, uh, a moment to think and pause that in a, such a small area, these peatlands are incredible storehouses of this carbon. And so much so that they that's twice all world forest. So a lot of effort and a lot of uh, talk about conserving forest, which is very much important and very much needed. But then if we talk in the, on the purely on the basis of the carbon, then peatlands does provide a very good strategy. Um, so this peat layer provides a unique permanent store of carbon. And I, I want to emphasize this permanent store for carbon that if it is not disturbed, because as long as the water or hydrology is maintained, as long as there is no uh, decomposition is happening, that carbon is, is stored permanently or for long term. But if that is disrupted, then that carbon is very vulnerable. And keeping this carbon in ground is crucial to keep global average temperature increase and below two degrees Celsius. However, drainage and degradation of peatlands is very common and it leads to emission of greenhouse uh, gases to the atmosphere. So when we are talking about climate change and mitigation, this provides a very clear, um, uh, if I can say solution, that if you can prevent drainage and degradation, then of course you can extend that 
uh, uh, you can extend the life of that carbon in peatland and then reduce any emissions. And peatland uh, drainage for agriculture and com commercial forestry is an immediate and most wide ranging global threat to integrity of these ecosystems. So what I want to say from here is that particularly the tropical peatlands that we talk about, since this is the land area which where uh, a lot of population depend for agriculture or a lot of economic activities, uh, these peatlands, these tropical peatlands experience huge pressure and the drainage is being done in countries like Indonesia and in some cases in Peru, um, which is resulting into a loss of that carbon into atmosphere. And not only loss of carbon to atmosphere, but the integrity of these ecosystem also compromise because they have historically been evolved as a, a wet environment or wet ecosystem. And once you drain that, uh, that balance is uh, disrupted. Drained peatlands are also more susceptible to fire. So this is kind of a common sense. If uh, an area which has high carbon content and it is not wet, it will be susceptible for fire. And once it catches fire, once it's burning, it's also difficult to take control or, or, or curb that fire because these are really deep, um, highly carbon rich deposits. And this graphic on the right shows uh, once peatland drainage happen, not only it increases fire frequency, uh, which results in greenhouse gas emission, so which makes this negative feedback because we are by uh, fire in peatlands is increasing the greenhouse gas to atmosphere, which is again a part of the problem. But along with this, it also results in biodiversity loss. So there are various species of birds or, or fishes or wildlife, which are dependent in a wet environment. And if water is gone, then they have to find a different habitat for their survival. Uh, it also compromises the ability for this landscape to provide uh, water, whether it's uh, the ecological integrity of these water bodies or uh, as a source of any river, but also water for uh, people who are living nearby as a drinking water. And then over time, uh, the land degradation happens. So that means uh, productivity losses, loss of native uh, species of vegetation, so and so forth. So it kind of sets into motion this downward spiral, if you will, where things become imbalanced and it's really difficult to put back in the original uh, form. So as I mentioned, it increases vulnerability of entire landscape as flow of ecosystem services is disrupted. So that's why uh, these uh, peatlands although very small in their geographical extent, they are very important as an ecosystem uh, in itself. In terms of uh, when we talk about climate change adaptation, and I've already discussed uh, what adaptations mean, it's adjusting to the new reality. Uh, there are a lot of critical ecosystem services and biodiversity benefits that peatlands provide. And this graphic on the right kind of lists them following this uh, millennium assessment uh, there are four categories of uh, ecosystem services, such as provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting. And uh, I, I don't know if you can figure out the different color schemes here, but basically all these different ecosystem services are divided into this four typology. And peatlands happen to provide one or other for each of these four categories. So if we are talking about climate change adaptation, if these services are disrupted, then it would be very difficult for people and uh, other biological uh, entities to adjust to new realities due to climate change, whether it's a higher temperature or whether it's the change in the home range, whether it's the availability of fresh water or whether it's availability of food and so on and so forth. So maintaining peatlands in, in, in its natural form or shape allows us to adapt to the new change reality due to climate change, which is already going to happen. Um, I kind of touched upon this next point where I mentioned peatlands are integral to regional hydrology and depending on season and peatland type, they regulate water flows or ecological flows of water in local bodies, affecting the local biodiversity, local people who, who might be uh, dependent on that fresh water 
in their local stream for that matter. So after um, going through this uh, list of uh, importance of peatlands and, and why they can uh, play an important role when you talk about climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, uh, I, I wanted to touch a little bit about uh, peatlands for sustainable future. And I mentioned that there's a lot of degradation and drainage already happening. But if we want to do something about it, what options do we have? And I divided into two different categories. One is conservation of these peatlands, uh, which are still existing. And second one is restoring of peatlands, which are drained or degraded. And these are some of the, uh, the points that I listed under each of, each of these two categories. So basically, to conserve what we do have is basically commit to uses that does not require drainage. So think about uh, avenues of generating livelihoods that doesn't require drainage, uh, reducing unsustainable land use. So sometimes peatlands are drained for commercial crops, which are not as efficient or as productive. Uh, so maybe uh, we need to think about sustainably and not change any land use into an unsustainable, uh, uh, for an unsustainable uh, need. Um, then there are uh, areas where supply chain should exclude products from drain peatland. So this relates to, uh, for example, the, the palm oil. Um, you might have heard palm oil is used uh, in almost ubiquitous in all kinds of consumer products, even food items and so on and so forth. Malaysia and Indonesia are one of the largest suppliers of these palm oil. So there must be some kind of uh, a need to look into where this palm oil is being produced, where are those plantations, and if they are affecting peatlands, then we, we try to think about uh, solutions which are not so, uh, which doesn't have that kind of ecological footprint. Uh, that kind of covers the next point, removing existing plantation from peatlands. And then lastly, climate smart land use for severely, severely degraded soils. So if they, we have soils in the country which are severely degraded, but that can be used for to supplement our agricultural produce by using climate smart um, technologies or uh, options. We should go for that instead of using or draining a new pet peatland area to develop uh, or supplement increasing demands in food crops. For restoration, um, since I mentioned uh, peatlands require to be saturated, and if a peatland is drained, uh, one simple and obvious solution seems to be rewetting those drained areas. So that's what restoration calls for, rewetting those drained area. Although in practice, it might be very difficult because uh, uh, rewetting at a landscape level is not easy and there are legacy issues. And then um, secondly, prevention of fire and control the, the causes or reason. So this the first point kind, kind of takes care of second point. If you have a, a drained peatland which is rewetted, your fire is already prevented. But if rewetting uh, is not easily done or taking time, then one need to take action that prevent fire. Um, local economic development is important because a lot of times in landscape like this, which is very human focused or a human uh, pressure is quite there. Um, and uh, it could be reduced if there are some alternative ways of economic development, which does not uh, result into a sort of a negative impact to peatlands. Um, a lot of talk has been going on about availability of finance for these kind of economical development. So uh, a sustainable finance system for local communities would definitely help in this direction. And this has to be backed up with some kind of legisl legislation and policy embedding. So that, for example, in Indonesia, uh, there was some moratorium on draining uh, peatland for, for certain land uses. So those kind of policies have to be, uh, to be developed or, or uh, passed at national level for restoration to happen. Now, uh, briefly want to share what uh, peatland research uh, c4 is currently engaged with so i'll just provide uh, snippets of most recent activity 
although there are various pr uh, programs at C4 that have been running for almost 10 years, which has focused on peatlands across different sites. And they worked into uh, those projects have worked into different aspects of under enhancing our understanding of peatland uh, dynamics, biophysical aspects, and and various uh, facets which combine uh, social uh, social and policy as well as the scientific understanding. Uh, so this has been going on ten years, but recently we we focused on synthesis of all that information, all the data, the knowledge that has been generated over time, and to bring out uh, what we call policy briefs, which could be a tool for policymakers and uh, advocacy groups, as well as governments to, to make or factor in these uh, priorities in their decision-making. We've also carried out mapping and assessment of degradation, understanding uh, which vegetation uh, are being affected in certain areas, what are the 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 impacts or drivers of these degradation and what kind of carbon stocks or greenhouse gas fluxes uh, result when these peatlands are degraded. Uh, we also engage in uh, uh, developing new maps as our understanding um, increases, enhances. So we have enhanced maps of uh, Peruvian Amazon peatland. So those again allows us a better map, allows for better decision making when we know what is where we can, uh, uh, that can help in planning, particularly uh, during regional planning. So we engage in those activities as well. At science and policy interface, uh, there have been uh, various uh, meetings at regional, national, international level, uh, both uh, called by and facilitated by uh, C4 with national governments. And this has happened in Africa, in Peru, in Indonesia. C4 has a International Tropical Peatland Center, where uh, different national governments have their uh, focal points on deciding and designing peatland policies. Uh, government of Peru recently invited C4 scientists to support a uh, peatland definition classification system and map new criteria and methods for mapping and then integrating peatlands into forest reference emission levels. This is a requirement by countries under a Paris Agreement uh, to UNFCCC to, to report what kind of emissions are happening from their forestry sector. So C4 scientists provide those kind of technical uh, and information as well as inputs. And then uh, we carry out a lot of capacity building and training of key actors, be it government officials or de various line departments and so on and so forth. So we, we do engage in those activities. So having uh, discussed uh, about peatland research, climate change, about C4 soils, I thought to just take a few more minutes uh, this is kind of a summary slide of my talk. If you want to remember something from this talk, this kind of covers everything. So I talked about climate change and what are climate stressors. So if you start from the top here, uh, the causes of climate change or, or one of the impacts of uh, climate change are these rising temperatures, sea level rise, frequent extreme events and change precipitation patterns. So if we come down towards uh, the left side of this arrow, you follow, and you take an example of an intact peatland, that intact peatland had a, 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 a one important quality, which is it's resilient. It is resilient in the, in the context of any change or any disturbance. Uh, and it has a tendency to support uh, the ecological services or the benefits that are being derived from this system. So it maintains hydrological function, mitigate floods and drought. It is resistant to fire. It maintains biodiversity, maintain carbon balance, and uh, sustain environmental and human welfare. So these are intact peatlands, and th they are resilient. Uh, but human impacts, such as deforestation, degradation, drainage, and burning, result into degraded peatlands, which becomes vulnerable. And I kind of touched upon the reasons why these peatlands become vulnerable once they are drained, they lose the hydrologic functions. They are um, more susceptible to fire. They also uh, experience subsidence because the water has gone down. So they kind of drop down a little bit. So there is subsidence, uh, biodiversity loss happens, and then there is a negative carbon uh, balance. So here it results into negative feedback to 
the, the climate. So the problems that was caused by initially by increased global warming, this kinds of degraded peatlands feed into that. And then if a fire event happens, then a lot more greenhouse gases are emitted and this is an additional forcing. So the idea is to think about, I'm bringing you here on the left side, sustainable landscape. So once a landscape is sustainable, it not only works at carbon sink, so that uh, takes into account our climate mitigation, but also continues to provide all ecosystem services and which helps in climate, uh, climate adaptation. So the question here is what can we do to, to have less of these degraded peatlands or less of these vulnerable peatlands and have more of resilient peatlands? And for areas that we cannot conserve or protect, for areas which are already degraded, uh, restoration might be uh, one of that solution. How we can keep them wet, how we can keep them, uh, bring them back into their resilience. So important takeaway message uh, is to prioritize conservation. So uh, I think uh, uh, the previous speaker also mentioned that she really liked the idea of uh, prevention because it is really difficult to fix things once it's broken. So whatever is not broken, try best that it doesn't break down. So conservation of remaining natural peatlands and then no expansion of drainage land uses on peat. Secondly, to remove unsustainable land uses. Um, I have touched upon these things, so I won't repeat it here, but basically acting before the carbon store is, is gone or acting before the drainage limit is reached. Those are like taking actions before it's too late. And then facilitating climate smart investment uh, through coherent policy and legislation, facilitating public private investment. And then finally, ensuring safeguards. There's a lot of talk about equity in this, uh, in this space and how do we ensure that everyone uh, like local communities who are living there or people who are uh, deriving benefits uh, do continue to receive those. And this could be done by a robust way of monitoring and verification uh, uh, for all of these restoration, activity, uh, restoration activities. So with that, I end here and there are a few of the pictures from our field work in Peru. And I thank you for your attention and I'm open for any questions, comments, discussions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sunita. Sunita ma'am is asking for her to be unmuted now. Done now. I'm unmuted now. Thank you. I don't know how to go to muting. I'm so sorry, sir, about that. So thanks a lot, sir, for such a really engrossing, informative talk on the climate change topic. And the beach is very, very um, engrossing for all of us. And uh, now with your permission, sir, uh, can we take a question from the chat box? Yes, please. Okay, sir. Uh, but before taking the questions, I want to request all the participants to fill the feedback form from today's sec uh, session. And the link has been shared, I think, in the chat box, but will be shared shortly. So uh, now we can move on to the question and answer session, sir. So, um, so one question is, from uh, Ms. Rajini Kumari. She's asking, is recently occurred Amazon fire affected the peatland, sir? I think it's from last year yeah. in August. So the Amazon fire, which, was, which is 
was very much in news lately also uh, happened in amazon basin not necessarily the identified peat areas but it was i think in one of the largest wetland pantanal which got severely affected and like all wetlands have this tendency of storing this organic carbon because the carbon doesn't oxidize when these are saturated and these areas which caught fire essentially uh, during the summer months these dried out there was no water and a lot of uh, a lot of these areas got burned so if you ask a question about whether <laughs> peatland got affected of course the fire affected it it depends only on the nature of that fire because sometimes uh, for all all peatland fire what is important is to know the depth of that fire how deep it went into that and some some areas peat is could be very very deep uh, sometimes mm, if much deeper fire occurs then the loss of the carbon is immense and uh, it's very impactful but if it is superficial maybe because the the lower uh, portions of peat is still wet then the loss is not not that much and it's also a cyclic nature or seasonal because in in the rainy season there will be water it will be all flooded so then uh, maybe it will give it a chance to recover but what happens i just want to extend it that after fires from peatland when the water comes a lot of these carbon which has now been broken down by fire loses and it 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 is lost from the system so not only the the fire that uh, fire burning that caused loss of uh, co2 in a gaseous form a lot of carbon in dissolved organic carbon or or different forms of uh, dissolved carbon leave the system uh, in liquid form and that is also a loss although it goes to a different uh, ecosystem maybe it through river it will uh, eventually go to ocean and then maybe help uh, uh, some uh, maybe uh, members of food web with it additional carbon but from peatland standpoint from peatland budget that carbon is lost forever uh mr devidas kapadnis he wants to ask that what effect have humans had on peat swamp areas humans has impact <laughs> has extensive effects if you okay. and i i didn't have any any map uh, that i could show but mostly as i was hinting in areas like in indonesia and malaysia the these areas were drained extensively and converted into different plantations for commercial plantations for oil palm and the technique they used uh, and for any peatland this is the common technique is by digging canals and once you dig a canal it lowers the water table and that's how a peatland is drained and then it provides a very good soil if you will a substrate once it is dry because you can imagine how rich in carbon it is how black the soil is so uh, a lot of plants can grow as long as uh, the water level is down so in terms of um, quantification uh, there are reports and and i could point you to some of the sources uh one is uh, if you want to look up there is a global peatland initiative gpi that has a website and there are other sources where you can actually see the impacts through human activities and that can be clubbed as basically land use and land cover change in different countries so yes huge impact and then um I think it's me to d um uh, it's miss or mr and oh, i'm sorry so uh, they want to ask is there any agency that funds wetland study um yes there are agencies that's how c4 is funded because c4 is uh, not a grant making institution it's a research institution and it has got its uh, the research funding from usaid plus there is a uh, agencies which we call as uh, bilateral funding agencies as well as governments uh, um, uh, different like uh, norwegian government has given a big chunk of funding as well as uh, german ministry but those are very much uh, institutional based like they won't govern uh, they won't give an individual funding or a, to a a researcher at a university per se 
they need a big organization, big consortium, what we call, which will have partners from university who will conduct the research. They will have some NGOs, partners who will work with communities and so on and so forth. So for when you are talking about wetland study, it is not apparently clear what you're talking. If you're talking about a study that is a small study that you conduct, uh, and I don't know if you're a student or a faculty, but I'm assuming if it's a student-led a project like as a PhD or master's, then I believe the scope of that study would be limited. And so in that way, the target for your funding would be also limited, but there are small organizations in US as well as elsewhere, they will provide funding for field work or funding for your equipment or lab study and so on and so forth. So you have to target that. But if you're talking about a big, large grants, there are different agencies like uh, David and Lucille Foundation or Peckard Foundation. Uh, there are uh, agencies like uh, um, uh, NORAD, uh, which is a Norwegian Agency for International Development, I believe. So they also have funding. So big entities who are working in the area of climate change uh, have started to put money on wetland and uh, studying wetland or more wetland or blue carbon research lately. There is money. So, uh, next question is uh, from Kishnet Pala, uh, Palani Velu. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. And um, the question is that is there any success story of peatland being a source of ecotourism? Yeah, so. <clears throat> Success story, when you say, then I have to think about some example where uh, an area which was um, maybe not popular for uh, tourism, uh, peatland area, but then it was converted or with some intervention, it was uh, transformed into an ecotourism success story. So uh, it's difficult for me to pinpoint which particular area, but I know in, in, uh, in Peru, uh, there is a big nature reserve, uh, Pacaya Samiria, which is, has a vast area, uh, which has peatlands, which has a river, it has water bodies. So it, it's like, you can think of as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary in Indian context, if, if you will. But this is a nature reserve there. And basically, they and how I am calling it eco tourism because there are strict, uh, very strict sort of policies of what activities are permitted in that area. So, even for conducting research, we have to do uh, or take a lot of permits, and there is strict policy uh, of not taking out anything. But there are a lot of uh, birders or tourists from all over Europe, they come there and they are kept in this uh, accommodations or houseboats on water. And there are a lot of guides, there are a lot of people involved. They are all recruited from local communities. So the benefit sharing mechanism is there. So in a sense, um, I don't know whether they call it a ecotourism um, model uh, there, but the idea behind benefiting uh, from tourism and distributing those benefits to the community so as to protect that area is there. So that's one example that comes to my mind. I'm pretty sure there are examples at a very small community level uh, in various parts of Indonesia. Uh, and I will be happy to point you out in, uh, to go to C4 website and look at, our, at the project section, you will find details of project report. So that will have more information. Sure, sir. So next question is again from Devidas Kapadnes, and uh, he wants to know that what role does water play in the creation of peat swamp forests? Water play, very important role. So if I can talk a little bit about uh, uh, biogeochemistry here. So for any organic material, like whether it's a plant, leaf, um, branch, root, uh, once the tree dies or once litter is formed, it all microbes work on it and it breaks down into small components. And there's a whole like cascade of events, like different small, there are, uh, before coming to microbes, even the bigger leaf is broken down into small pieces by different small, you know, maybe uh, 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 organisms. 
which break down into small pieces and then it breaks down into further pieces. But the ultimate, um, I would say the last in the chain are microbes who work on these small pieces, organic material for their energy. And then in the process, breaking down of that, that you know, those part, particles or those uh, components result into uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. So these microbes are very active or those are mostly by far are aerobic. So they need oxygen for this process to happen. When in, a, in any environment, I'm not talking just about peatland, but even in rice fields, for example, when it is saturated, then a lot of those aerobic microbes cannot function because the oxygen is not there. And in a setting, like in a forest setting, where there is a lot of influx of litter, but the breakdown is not happening essentially because of the water, then that, that uh, organic matter accumulates over time as a semi-decomposed material, and that forms peat. So this water plays an important role of barrier, if you will, to the oxygen. If you drain that water, then that area will be aerobic and oxygen will be available, and that's will uh, result into these microbes being interaction and breaking down. And so uh, that's why draining of peatland is bad because if you don't do anything, just take out the water over time, all that stores of carbon will be lost to the atmosphere because these microbes, which are always there, they will become active. Okay. So next question, I think you've already answered that, sir. Uh, from Ms. Sujata Kumari, she wants to ask how are peatland developed? So that has been taken up by sir and uh, next question is from miss uh, cecilia chu and um, the question is in terms of carbon storage is it better to not have peatland in the first place or have disturbed peatland okay. so in terms of carbon storage hmm. uh, is it whether better? it's Good to have to not have peatlands or to have them disturbed in disturbed peatland. Yes, there is there is none or there is a disturbed peatland over there. Well, um, I, I'm I'm finding it hard to understand, but I'll try to answer what I understood. So, if the person is asking uh, that, would it be better to have de degraded peatlands than to have no peatlands? If that's the question. I think that she would mean that, I think. It's not yes. more clear to me, sir, from the question here. <laughs> so assuming that's the question, uh, of course, uh, it's better to have a degraded peatlands uh, instead of having no peatlands, particularly so because if uh, even if they are degraded, we can do something about it. Uh, we cannot build or we cannot make new peatlands. So that is beyond human agency to make new peatlands. But if peatlands are there, if they are degraded, then something could be done to protect them and conserve them and do something. Uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, by re-wetting them, we can probably uh, keep them intact for longer. Okay, sir. So next question is from Dr. Meenam Bhatia. And the question is, is peatland ecosystem a dynamic system? and how peatland ecosystem is different from other marshy ecosystem. So is it dynamic first and then is it different from the marshy ecosystem? Well, um, I will say, I'll, I'll try to answer first the marshy one and then I'll come to dynamic. So again, the, the marshy one, I mentioned there are various names how the wetlands are classified. Some wetlands are um, called marsh, and then there are swamps and there are, uh, so basically if, if I say peatlands are type of wetlands and there are different kinds of wetlands, you know, marsh, fence, bogs. And then in, in peatlands, there are specifics which could be fence and bogs uh, amongst those. So uh, if you think about coastal marsh, uh, that is totally different than a peatland. And I do not think, um, in the context of the peatlands that I talk, anyone will call them marshy. Because if I, if I remember correctly my ecology, I may be wrong, but the marsh area doesn't have wooded vegetation as far as I know, but peatlands have wooded vegetation. So in that sense, there is a difference. Uh, 
In terms of dynamics, when you talk about ecosystem dynamics, again, you have to qualify it by what do you mean by if, if it's an energy balance or water balance or water uh, dynamics. So I would say most of the thriving ecosystems are dynamic ecosystems. Natural ecosystems are dynamic ecosystems. They go through different seasonal or cyclic uh, pattern throughout the year. There is a certain uh, level of you know energy balance, water balance, nutrient balance. So that goes through the cycle of there is a biodiversity that plays its role. So in that context, this is my view that all natural systems are dynamic systems. It is whether you want to look at it with a microscope or you would like to look at the bigger picture, you, you define your boundary conditions and then you can say whether in those boundary conditions, this particular ecosystem is still dynamic or not. But in general, I would say yes. Yes, sir. obviously. Uh, next question is from Ms. Rajni Kumari again. And the question is, sir, in your geographical distribution, um, so in the geographical distribution of peatland worldwide, the temperate peatland area is more than tropical. Is there any reason behind this? Yes, there is a reason behind it. Uh, the reason is that in, in the temperate area, uh, the, so the reason why it is higher is that over time, tropical peatlands are, although when they are saturated, they are all... Um, what do you call, uh, uh, they, are, they, they, does, they do not decompose, but they do go through cycle of say flooding and natural cycles of inundation and also drainage depending on the cyclic nature of rainfall availability of water. So during those cycles, some of the, the peat deposits or some of the organic matter is either lost or a, a lost to atmosphere or is drained through the water. Most of the temperate ecosystems uh, or where you see peatlands are for most part of the year are frozen. There are only a small part of the year where uh, a growth happens or springtime. And that's where whatever the, the organic matter or what due to, you know, uh, phototropy due to the, the photosynthesis that is formed, that basically becomes part of the soil. So one reason uh, higher is that the, temp the temperature is low throughout the year. And so there is less chances of being lost. Also, those are the areas which are less human impacted, if you will. Because those, if you talk about even higher up from temperate, the tundra regions, large expanse of Russia, Siberia, or Canada, which you see that map showed. Yes. Though, there's not much human activity going on there. There's not much of perturbation there. Uh, that cannot be said for our tropical areas. And then third thing, which again, I will uh, say a little bit uh, going out on a limb. I don't, I cannot recall a study that particularly said that, but it's my understanding that the tropical peatlands formed in areas uh, which were affected by uh, river flows. So depressional areas in the landscape where water came in and stagnated and whatnot. So in that sense, geographically, these are much more dynamic system. And that dynamics um, allows it to also, while at some time, uh, create wetlands, but also in the geological history of planet that might have resulted into some loss of the peatlands also. So the current map that you see today uh, you will see less in the tropical areas and more in, in the temperate. temperate. Yeah. Next question is from Mamta Kaushik Ji. Uh, she's asking, uh, do you have any idea at which rate these peatlands are disappearing due to climate change? Hmm. Um, in terms of the overall global extent, uh, I I cannot quote a number right here, but I recently read a report which said that so many millions of peatlands or peatland area is disappearing every year, but that's not necessarily quantifying it just by climate change because it is difficult. If you think of designing some kind of study, it is difficult to pinpoint that this loss is happening by climate change. Most of the drivers are human induced, whether it's fire, whether it's drainage, whether it's uh, changing topography, hydrology, what 
whatnot. But it's difficult to just say that humans have nothing to do, but the global climate change is causing that. One thing I can say though, is that the increased temperature, you know, ambient uh, air temperature has increased. So that has contributed globally in a sense that for drained peatlands, for areas which doesn't have water anymore, the microbes which are now working on this carbon and degrading it or decomposing it, their rate has increased with temperature. So there is a relationship between the temperature and this decomposition rate. So increased temperature worldwide enhances that rate. So you can attribute that, that, that the loss is increased now because higher temperature allows these microbes to be more active. Sir, um, Omkar Koshti wants to ask, how efficiently can we use peatlands? Um, efficiently, so again, you have to define efficiently for whom or for what, whether it's uh, efficiently for human needs, like how much uh, return on investment you get, or efficiently for ecosystem per se, like how good is it in, in conserving or, or, or protecting a biodiversity or conserving carbon or ensuring water flows. So uh, it again will have different uh, strategic uh, or different strategies or different management options, how you want to define that efficiency. That's why the term that most people are more comfortable with is sustainable which defines sustainable development of human beings, but not at the co cost of ecology or ecosystem or nature. Um, yes. so I don't know if I've answered your question, but uh, again, this is something that I may not be able to tell you right away. Yeah, they are related. So if we are uh, doing it efficiently for um, a purpose, like in, um, power plants and all, and if we can do it efficiently, in that case, we will be doing it efficiently for the ecosystem as well, sir. Yeah. So yeah, they both are related. So next question is from Dr. Preeti Rawat, and she wants to ask like, how frequent are peatland fire episodes? And is there any data available on the role of human interventions in peatland fire episodes? Yes, Preeti. So frequency of peatland fire, uh, sporadic fire events almost happen annually and in countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm naming just two countries here, but there are other countries where these, uh, these happens. But these, if I'm talking, these are more sporadic events. This might be small fire events, which are contained um, in um, maybe a few days or so and so forth without case, causing huge damage. But uh, really catastrophic big events that uh, I think in, in 2005 or 2007, there was a huge news of Indonesian peat fire, which lasted for many days. And it even caused haze and smoke even to different countries and islands, even all the way to, to Singapore. Those events are thankfully relatively less. When, when you talk about different ways of monitoring, so I think there are different efforts at national level. For example, Indonesia has one uh, automated system, I think they call it Simatag, um, if I remember correctly. And that is a portal where they uh, put the data from satellite uh, and then you can monitor where the fires are taking place currently or in the past, how much was the extent and what are the areas that uh, got affected. I think uh, in other countries, I don't know what their system is, but you can find some information. Plus there is uh, some amount of literature that is available uh, about uh, peatland fires, uh, people who have researched, people who are uh, doing conducting research. But one thing that I would like to mention, uh, one of the things that I find a little weakness about these data is that they do not accurately capture the depth of that fire which is really difficult without your field presence, without ground to think. So these satellite or remote sensing um, uh, tech techniques or technologies will tell you the extent, the area, but not the depth. And if you are not knowing the exact depth, then uh, it is difficult to quantify the actual loss in terms of carbon. 
so you won't get the volume you know what i'm saying you will only get the area but not the volume and without knowing the volume it is difficult to know the actual loss rate but there are different efforts and there are different ways in which people are trying to advance because like i am raising this question everyone else knows that this is a big uh, knowledge gap so people are working towards it absolutely sir so next question is from dr brijesh k dwivedi he wants to ask what is succession scale of peat forest and what is the role of carbon sequestration for nature care what is the succession stage succession succession scale sir scale scale sir of peat um, forest okay so peatlands in general uh, what i have seen and studied are huge areas so in terms of like geographical scale uh, it depends on basically uh, i can say at landscape level but it is also affected by the hydrology so you can think about at a watershed scale if the conditions are right then i have seen peat peat domes which are uh, even like 10 kilometers across so uh, in indonesia particularly intact areas in in an um Kalimantan i think or uh, west uh, papua there are areas which are huge intact peat and these these are many many uh, thousands of uh, acres in area or many kilometers across so the scale is could be very high uh, also there are smaller peatlands also like small pockets which are very small in area uh, second part of the question was about climate the role change. of carbon sequestration for mm-hmm. nature care role of carbon sequestration, sequestration for nature care well carbon uh, as you know is the main or ultimate currency of our biological systems so i was trying to say that you know these microbes work uh, on um, organic matter and they are after this carbon for their energy supply so if carbon is sequestered uh, in any ecosystem if there is healthy stores of carbon and associated nutrients that one needs then basically the the biogeochemical cycling will uh, be more efficient more smooth and whatever however the that ecosystem is functioning or uh, and if we call it uh, the derived nature benefits or or uh, uh, or the Uh, services that uh, we call ecosystem services those would be uh, ensured so i personally see that uh, ca- uh, carbon sequestration will be a good thing in that sense not only from the context of climate change but at the ecosystem level uh, also it's important okay sir so cecilia chu is saying that uh, yes you answered the question like no peat land versus degraded peat land that's what she wanted to ask sir so she is happy about that is thanking you sir next question is uh, from vikram sahrawat and um, he is asking that what are the effects of freeze thaw on hydraulic properties of peat peatlands uh, mires and organic soil in general so now i'm thinking um, this question is based mostly on the temperate peatlands because that those are the only ones which experience freeze and thaw tropical peatlands don't go through this freeze yes, thaw cycle and there has been a very very interesting and recent paper that came out in nature i think last year where they studied this particular aspect particularly in light that lot of areas which were earlier frozen are now uh, seeing this thawing event because of the increased temperature so the question is what happens with this freezing and thawing so first thing is that when uh, like i was mentioning earlier in the permafrost or in the frozen section a lot of uh, microbes and their enzymes which help in breaking this uh, organic matter are not so active or functional so when and and they, these area typically when they are frozen they also are very like they are saturated with water too so that's why this is known as permafrost frost is for the water component but it's all frozen so as soon as water is thawed or you know it melts the the water kind of receives and the structural composition of that thing a uh, kind of disappears so you can think about it that the icicles the ice is providing the scaffolding and keeping the whole landscape or the land or the surface intact when the water melts and kind of drains away as per the topography as per the 
the the gradient of landscape you, what you remain is this mush kind of thing which is organic material uh, where water has been drained out so it kind of deflates the landscape and you you will see this uh, imbalance and um, uh, i would say that the, the breakdown of the structural composition which leads to further degradation and then uh, when the water leaves then it is open to decomposition processes the microbes are active and with the subsequent cycling what happens is all this degraded material finds its way through water so it dissolves and then it leaves the surface so it kind of um, gets into this um, feedback loop or a vicious cycle where first thawing and degradation result in some loss then subsequent will kind of exacerbate it and so on and so forth so if the cycle continues then the stability of the entire landscape is compromised so i think because of this only the peat is spongy also sir yes exactly. the yeah, yeah. okay so and the next part of his question is vikram's question only sir is asking could you give me references about modeling of sediment transport of erodible material from peatland um i can certainly find uh, i personally haven't done much work on modeling but uh, this is an interesting topic and when you talk about erodible material then uh, you're talking about uh, flow velocities and things where it has a uh, mechanical capacity to erode material so in terms of peatlands uh, how it will be effective or whether there such studies have been conducted i'm not really sure peatlands typical are not typically are not known as high flow through systems as far as i know like they do not as unlike a coastal setting where there is always tidal flow there is you know river influences in an estuary and so and so forth or interstitial setting in a river flood plain and so and so forth peatlands do not experience that kind of uh, uh, quick inundation or or drop in water levels but i will try to dig up and um, my email id is there if you don't mind and this goes for all people who have asked any questions here or have any future questions please feel free to uh, respond or or write to me and uh, send me your questions or thoughts or any comments i'll be happy to respond to you there personally certainly can share, share the email. papers yeah we will definitely share your email id with the participants also sir mm-hmm. we'll do that and um, the next question is from dr neeti yadav and she is asking it seems that these peatlands have higher water holding capacity than mineral soils do they also purify the water and if yes then can we use the underground water for other purposes also yes niti that is correct one of the ecosystem services these uh, peatlands provide is uh, uh, this water supply and uh, they have water holding capacity as uh, more than mineral so- soils that's correct they also have capacity to supply water uh, during deficit time so peatlands are uh, the areas where peat is found are typically wet in the peak of summer where rest of your forest or rest of your landscape may not have water at all if they had mineral soils so yes they do have this capacity when you talk about purifying water um again if you're looking at the ground water you said underground but i'm assuming it's the ground water that you're referring her here so if it, the ground water typically is the water that has gone through this uh, you know passed through the soil layer whether it's a mineral soil or uh, unless it's a clay layer which is impervious mostly but uh, most of the cases ground water has already gone through the soil profile and it's been purified in that process so the water that Uh, uh it's hard for me to think about a scenario where we are talking about a really a deep underground or or groundwater in peat settings because peatlands are typically wet and saturated so water is right there at the surface level so getting uh, like groundwater from peatland and then what we can be using it uh, it's it's a thought experiment i think <laughs> yes sir so next is um, from nitika chandra of ploddy culture in peatland management what is the role sir so paludiculture is basically um 
practice of carrying out agriculture or carrying out of uh, growing crops or um, species of economic importance in wet setting so essentially it is considered as one of the restorative techniques where you are using those species of plants that can grow in wet environment or wet setting so you do not have to drain peatlands and if you are not draining peatlands then you are basically maintaining it in in so called natural state or condition so paludic culture is definitely uh, promising uh, particularly as a source of revenue or economic incentive for people not to drain peatlands uh, there are uh, different um, groups who believe otherwise uh, like for any other uh, current solutions for our climate issues or problems uh, some people think that paludic culture uh, will also result in some sort of interventions or disturbance in the natural environment and if we really want uh, peatland to be restored in its original erstwhile form or shape we let it be like that we shouldn't be encroaching upon so from that school of thought paludic culture is not considered as a solution while on the other hand there are other more pragmatic or practical people who think that uh there are a lot of communities and people who are dependent on peatlands and this provides a kind of a, a trade off between draining the peatland or keeping it wet and growing something so uh, i don't know if i have answered your question but that's that's how oh, my understanding of paludic culture okay. so there are still many more questions i think you have already suggested to email you if you have any more queries so our participants our audience can ask Uh, questions on the given email id sir because there are many left still now so, so and i'm not short of time <laughs> i'm not sure what have i done whether i confused a lot of people or i instigated a lot of interest so if it's the first one then i'm worried but if it's the second one then i'm happy <laughs> first one is not at all sir for sure it's only <laughs> second one it, so it's so um, yes sir so now um, i once again want to remind all the participants to uh, please fill up the feedback form the link has been shared already in the chat box so please do so for today's talk today's session and so now sir um, i want to thank you for patiently answering all the questions from the audiences and wonderfully sir and giving such an informative and interesting talk thanks a lot sir and uh, i want to invite dr madhurani now for vote of thanks Uh, over to you, Madhu, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sanita. It would be rather a concluding remarks uh, because we are uh, keeping safe side for word of thanks for the last uh, day of our uh, webinar. So we have come to the uh, end of first day actually, uh, the first webinar of the series of uh, three day uh, webinar series, uh, which is uh, organized by uh, the Department of Botany, Deshwandu College, uh, Delhi University, in uh, uh, collaboration with. the institute of ocean and earth sciences university of malaya uh, uh, malaysia uh, it is a, a great privilege and an honor to provide some closing remarks at this gathering mm -hmm. and uh, first and foremost i would like to express my gratitude to our distinguished speakers dr jillian oilin sim and uh, dr rupesh k bhomia for not mm -hmm. only sparing their uh, invaluable time for us to grace this occasion but also for enlightening us with their commendable talk on the subjects Dr Jillian uh, talked uh, uh, about the development uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, uh, sea grasses actually uh, we people who are living uh, at Delhi University who are living in the mainland we are very far away from the coastal region and uh, i am very happy to accept myself that i have never uh, realized that uh, the sea meadows they are so wonderful and their views they are so captivating so it is really an enlightening uh, talk uh, dr jillian and you developed our understanding and uh, you also uh, talked about overcoming the seagrass blindness which is in itself a very uh, challenging part but it is still possible and dr rupesh you shared some scientific methodologies and information from your field research uh, conducted in peat swamp forest and to determine the impacts of vegetation losses and habitat degradation on carbon storage potential of these ecosystems again uh, these fields are uh, new to us and we have very less knowledge about these uh, fields so thank you so much for enlightening uh, all us all of us here 
about these two uh, very important ecosystems and we have got your message very clear uh, dr jillian and dr rupesh that we need to realize we need to acknowledge uh, these two uh, ecosystems and we need to realize their critical uh, place in uh, uh, you can say uh, uh, in the ecosystems uh, in maintaining these ecosystems and uh, we definitely need to conserve it and uh, secondly i would like to express my uh, humble thanks to our co-host team uh, for this webinar series from institute of ocean and earth sciences university of malaya malaysia uh, our chief guest and chairperson professor somyani yusuf uh, she's the director of ios and uh, coordinator uh, from ios dr rizman bin idid uh, convener of this webinar series dr saidev sharma and co conveners dr vichya and uh, kisnath palanivelu your diligent support empowered this uh, event and uh, here i would like to mention specially dr mm -hmm. saidev mm -hmm. because he took extra care for framing the webinar and planning the speakers in such a manner so as to relate us to different aspect of the theme our theme is understanding flora from aquatic ecosystems towards better conservation and sustainable use and he did it in a very systematic manner so we have developed a understanding uh, i would also like to extend my gratitude uh, to the guiding force behind uh, organizing this event our patron our principal uh, professor rajiv agarwal sir and uh, not to mention special thanks goes to uh, the dedication and enthusiasm of our leader our teacher in charge uh, of botany department uh, deshbandhu college dr aparna notial and all my seniors and uh, fellow colleagues they have guided and supported us at every step and uh, they made uh, they helped to make this uh, event possible and needless to say uh, dr monica here monica bajaj from uh, department of computer science she has taken extra care of the technical front and uh, she has uh, done it so nicely that this webinar uh, could uh, proceed smoothly and we can see uh, although we see many uh, technical glitches nowadays but i think we are uh, fortunate uh, to uh, go through it smoothly to sail through it my heart also goes out to thank our participants from different colleges uh, departments and institutes from different countries and uh, for accepting our invitation for participating and attending the webinar with enthusiasm and i am thankful for them uh, to take up uh, to put up so many questions and i am i really appreciate uh, the uh, patience of our speakers <laughs> to bear with us and answer all the questions possible here and uh, without uh, the presence of the participants yes we could not make uh, this uh, be able to accomplish the dream which we had uh, for this webinar and uh, let's have a special recognition for all the student vol volunteers who are working behind the curtain their diligent work uh, is the driving force uh, for such events i also express my gratitude to our non teaching staff for helping in many ways and uh, now uh, i will request all the participants uh, to switch on the cameras and so we can capture the moment and i will request my it team so to take some uh, screenshots mm -hmm. I hope my IT team has got what we uh, wanted to. We can cherish these memories, and <laughs> we can also put uh, all the photographs on our website. Also, we are actually maintaining a web page uh, regarding this uh, webinar series. i request all the participants to go to that webinar page if they want to uh, get more information about our uh, speakers they have shared uh, uh, many uh, links uh, including their email ids with us so it is available there thank you all of you and uh, it's not the end actually it's beginning of the uh, second day <laughs> so i will request you all to join us tomorrow also and day after uh, tomorrow for further enriching and thought provoking talks by our esteemed speakers and thank you all I think now I can end the session.